as uh, requested uh, by uh, the Bashar Sambo and also the Sakha Tichin uh, family and the Sangha members and all of you. Uh, today I will be giving this teaching uh, as part of the uh, Dharma event which is uh, to, be held, uh, to be held this week uh, with uh, the Holinesses, the 41st Sangha of Matija Nietzsche and the Holiness of the 42nd Sangha of visit here to Kudalsen. So uh, to begin the week of teachings, I was requested to give a teaching on the history of the Sangha tradition. So this is very important to uh, learn, to understand, uh, because uh, it is my belief, I believe that uh, in order to truly uh, generate devotion in the gurus, you, you really need to understand uh, their activities, you need to understand uh, their biography, uh, how they lived. Because uh, as followers of our root guru and our past gurus, we, we should try to emulate uh, their, uh, we should try to look up to their uh, life, uh, their lifestyle as an example for our own Dharma practice. So therefore, uh, in order to copy the lifestyle of the Guru, we need to first understand how do they practice, <coughs> what did they learn, and uh, how do they benefit sentient beings, what were the efforts they made uh, to benefit the, for the Dharma in general, the Sakya tradition in particular, and also all sentient beings of course. So in order to learn this, we need to uh, learn a bit about history. This is important. So we need to look back into the past, times of past. And uh, in today's case, I'll be we will be looking back into the uh, history of Sakya. And uh, the Sakya tradition uh, currently is uh, 949 years old. It was founded in 1073 uh, by Kunkuntu uh in Sakya which is in Tsang Tibet. And uh, it is soon to uh, turn 1,000 years old. It will turn 1,000 years old in 2073. So if I'm still alive by then, I will be 74 years old. But uh, I'm still 23. Right? So it's a long way to go. And uh, there's nothing certain about life, but hopefully we'll live to see that day. But anyways, um, to learn about the history of Sakya, uh, we need to learn a bit about the Sakya genealogy, uh, which is basically the history of the Sakya family lineage, the, which is the Kun family lineage. Because there's no way to explain the history of Sakya without looking into the history of the Kun family. And this is because the Kun family was responsible for first founding the tradition and also for propagating the tradition. And also in the future, uh, it is mainly in the hands of the Kern family. The, the survival of the, of the Sakya tradition is mainly uh, uh, relied on the uh, survival of the Kern family. So therefore, it's important to learn about this. And uh, there's also great merit for the speaker uh, to speak about the history of the Kern family lineage, because as uh, Jaya Kinze Wongo said, uh, there are two families uh, which said to have great merit if you extol or speak about their origins. Uh, the first family is, um, is a family from India. Uh, it, is the, it is the history of the world's first king. Uh, and uh, these are the ancestors of Shakyamuni Buddha. So it's an Indian family. Its origins are the Indian family. And, um, they are the ancestors of Shakyamuni Buddha. So there's great merit in extolling that, uh, the qualities of that family and their origins. And then from the family from Tibet, uh, the most merit there is of extolling of the different families in Tibet is said to be the Kun family. So the Kun family and uh, the Shakyamuni Buddha's family are considered of like equal worth or value. So this is what the Jain Kinzawongo said, and uh, many uh, masters agree. Uh, 
important. So therefore, uh, to speak about the origins of the Kun family, the Kun family is uh, basically said to have three names. It is a family endowed with uh, three excellent names. The first is um, the family of um, clear light, uh, the celestial family of clear light. And then the second name of the family is uh, the stainless Kun family. And then the third name is uh, the father and Sakiba family. And um, so it has three names, but it's just basically one family. Over time, the, the, the family earned more and more names, and we have been able to have just like three names in total. So the first three members of the Kun family were said to be gods coming down from the heaven of clear light. The heaven of clear light is in the form realm. Uh, according to Buddhist cosmology, uh, there are three realms, the desire realm, form realm, in the formless realm. Uh, we humans are currently, currently living in the desire realm. And uh, all of the gods, <coughs> such as Indra and uh, so forth, they also live um, in uh, the desire realm. So the king of the gods, the 33 uh, heavens, and uh, Tushita heaven, uh, abode of Maitreya Buddha, all of those are in the desire realm. And then above that is the form realm. There are 17 uh, different heavens within the form realm itself. And the heaven of clear light is one of them. And so the first two members of the Kun family, there they were three brothers known as Jiring, Yuring, and Yusei. So Jiring was the eldest, Yuring was the, media, the, the middle son, and Yusei was the third son. They descended from that heaven down to Tibet uh, on the mountain known as uh, Shelsa Gyaona. And uh, having descended upon that uh, mountain, uh, they made that their living place, uh, the, the surrounding lands of that uh, mountain their living place. And um, they started the family. But uh, they were gods, they were not humans at all. And um, some of the gods who first came down, such as Jiring and Yusei, and also some of uh, the middle son, Yuring's sons, his sons also, many of them returned back to the heavens. So they first came down, but many of them returned back to the heavens. Uh, but uh, Yuring, the middle son, continued to stay uh, and continued the family line. And um, so for several generations, it was uh, pure gods. They were all completely gods. And although they had descended upon earth, uh, they did not uh, sleep or walk on the land. Uh, they actually were said to live on uh, in the space of earth. So in the sky, they lived in the earth's sky. And then later on, uh, one uh, member of the family known as Yapanke was born. Uh, He's called Yapanke because he was born between slate, which is a type of stone, and the meadow. So therefore, Yapanke. And uh, he went to war with another class of beings known as uh, what we call the Tibetan symbol. So it, uh, it would be in Sanskrit like the Raksha, the Raksha class. And uh, in English, you could uh, probably translate it either as uh, vampire. Or you could translate it as uh, ogre uh, type of uh, class. But uh, anyways, he fought uh, with that type of class, and uh, he particularly fought with a member of that class known as the bloodless vampire. And uh, he killed uh, and liberated the mind of that vampire. And, uh, and then also, he took the wife of that vampire, known as Yadum Silima, uh, who is said to be although you could call it an ogre, a vampires, and she was said to be very beautiful. So he lived a god and she as a vampires together with their union, they, uh, the, a member known as Kren Pagye was born. So Kren Pagye was the first uh, member of the family to earn the title of uh, name Kren. And Kren means conflict. Uh, it generally means conflict because it's a conflict between the heavenly race and 
the Raksha would be part of the vampire conflict. So because Quen Party was born between the conflict, between the war of the gods and the, and the vampires, he was called Quen. But on a more deeper level, um, you can understand it as conflict with ignorance, because Jiring, Yuring, Yusei, the first family members, and also all of the family members of the Quen family are considered to be emanations of Arya Manjushri, the embodiment of um, wisdom of all of the Buddhas of uh, the three times. So therefore, if you are Manjushri, then you are the uh, Buddha of wisdom, and uh, the opposite of wisdom is ignorance. So uh, if you're Manjushri, you need to have abandoned ignorance. You need to be far away from ignorance. So in that sense, you can understand it as the Kremlin family members are in conflict with ignorance, which basically means they have abandoned ignorance. So this is how we can understand it on a deeper level. And uh, when I visited Lubin uh, Pinjin, one of my main gurus in India before I left uh, for uh, the US and Europe uh, on this trip. Uh, we had a little discussion on the history between the Kun family and the Luding family. And uh, he made a very interesting comment. And he said that although it is not, you know, it is not really written down, it is his own belief uh, after you know, many, uh, after contemplating a lot that. Um, if the member known as Yapanke had not um, tamed, uh, if he had not uh, liberated uh, the Raksha, uh, you know, the, the vampire known as the bloodless vampire, uh, then it's likely that uh, this type of race, the Raksha, or the vampire race at that time would have uh, conquered Tibet. They were a uh, very fast, uh, growing race within Tibet, and they were becoming more and more powerful. So it just seems that um, it was the right time, and the Kun family members were needed to tame this race and prevent it from completely conquering uh, Tibet. And uh, it's similar to how Guru Gana Sambhava, the whole purpose of him going to the copper-colored mountain, uh, it was to prevent the Rakshas up there to overgrow and then take over the world. So he went there to keep them under control. So <coughs> sort of like the mission is similar, if you think of it in that way. So therefore, Yapang Palke, from him, the son Khun Palke was born. And then from Khun Palke, of course, several family generations, uh, there were members, successive members. And um, up until Khun Palbache, so Khun, or you could call it Gun Bajie Gun Bak. Gun Bajie Gun Bak. So Gun Bajie Gun Bak, um, he lived during the 8th century. We know this because he is said to be the cabinet minister of King Chisong Deltin, the 8th century king of Tibet. Uh, before that, we do not know um, the time of the, the, the time in which the Kwan family members lived because it was so early on and it was difficult to keep records back then. But we have at least the names of all of the Khun members, uh, all of the fathers and the mothers and the sons and so on. So Khun Bajie Khun Bak, he became the minister of King Chison Deltin. It is said that while he was the minister of the king, the king's treasuries were filled with wealth. So it seems he was a very uh, able, uh, a very smart and uh, efficient minister so therefore, he earned the title or name of Kun Balbache, which is sort of like a, the precious Kun. So uh, that is the name he earned. So he was the minister of the king. And if we uh, know a bit about the history of Tibet in general, we, uh, we know that King Chisong Deutsen invited, uh, first he had invited the abbot Shankarakshita, from India to Tibet uh, to propagate the Buddha Dharma, because uh, before that, uh, the, the Buddha Dharma was uh, not spread in Tibet. It was yet to be spread. So um, the main religion in Tibet before that was the Khenbo, or the Khen religion. And actually, certain Kungan Lodger uh, 
such a thing already is the 21st cycle teaching. He says that although there's no clear mention of what uh, religion the, con the early Khan family members followed, it's very likely that from the very beginning, um, starting from the time of Chiring Yuring and then up until Khan Babuche, they were uh, followers of the Khan uh, tradition. It's a uh, uh, early, uh, it's the main, uh, it, it, it is a religion that was founded in Tibet, but it's a non religious tradition. But uh, that's, uh, even though they are the emanations of Manjushri, there's no choice but to follow a, a belief system because uh, Buddhism was, uh, did not exist in Tibet at the time. But um, so on the outward appearance, they may, he says that it's very likely they were followers of the current tradition, but of course, their main mission as Bodhisattvas was to uh, dispel the ignorance of beings. So they certainly did benefit beings in the early period. And so, Khan uh, coming back to Khan Balbache, Khan Balbache had two sons, uh, Khan Nagendra Lakshita and uh, Khan Bhoja Linche. So, uh, these two became followers, um, direct disciples of Guru Bala Sambhava. So, as I mentioned earlier, first, uh, King Chisong Betsin invited the abbot Shanti Lakshita because the king wanted to build Samya Monastery first uh, monastery, the first Tibet, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monastery. And, uh, but the Shan Abbot was not able to help the king uh, because the demons in Tibet were so powerful that they were, uh, and these are particularly speaking, the Pern uh, demons belonging to the Pern tradition. So they were against um, the king's wishes uh, for building the monastery. So they would always cause obstacles. In the morning when the king and uh, his uh, subjects would build up the monastery, stacking up the stones. At night time, the demons would take down the stones. And so in that way, there was no progress for the monasteries you know, for it to complete. And so therefore, uh, the king seeked, uh, he sought uh, Shantalakshita's advice, and Shantalakshita told uh, the <coughs> king that there is a great, powerful uh, mantra adept uh, known as Gurudeva Sambhava, and the king should invite him to Tibet, and uh, in that way, if he can do that, the king's wishes will be fulfilled. And so therefore, uh, the king uh, followed accordingly and invited Guru Dhamma Sambhava to Tibet. And, um, and in that way, Guru Dhamma Sambhava tamed all of the Pern deities, made them into Buddhist uh, Dharma protectors, such as those we know as the 12 Denmark goddesses who guarded the land of snows. And so on. So and these were all tamed men in Dharma protectors, and the Sami monastery was uh, completed in the end. And uh, the Buddha Dharma was first established in Tibet in that way. So, therefore, um, Khan Nagendra Rakshita, the elder brother, and his younger brother, Khan Rojilinchen, both became direct disciples of Guru Rinpoche. They received the teachings mainly of the Nyingma tradition, uh, such as the teachings of Yangbak. Uh, Heruka, Yamba Heruka, and Vajra Kilaya, and also of uh, the protector deities related to the Kilaya cycle, such as Karmo and Vigya. So they received all of these teachings, and they practiced it, and they attained great siddhi, uh, or accomplishment, through their practice. And, and also an interesting thing to mention is that um, Karan Nagendra Rakshita, the elder brother, he became a direct disciple of uh, the Abbot Shantarakshita. And uh, because the Buddha Dhamma was just uh, finding its roots in Tibet, uh, there were no uh, Tibetans who were monks, uh, no Tibetans who were Buddhist monks and nuns at the time. So the Abbot Shantarakshita, because he is the Vinaya holder, he holds uh, the, the conduct of the Buddha, ordination lineage system, uh, he can uh, pass down the ordination vows and in that way restore the ordination vows and uh, make uh, many monks and nuns. And, uh, so therefore, he needed to first test if the Tibetans were capable of keeping the vows. If they're not capable, then it's not worth you know, his effort to restore the vows to the Tibetans. So he needed to check and see 
that if he were to give the value to the Tibetans, would they be able to keep it or not? So therefore, he didn't uh, grant or uh, bestow the vows to many people at the very beginning. He chose seven men, and uh, we call that the semi jin the seven uh, tested. And uh, so there are three uh, elder members, one uh, middle-aged member, and uh, three younger members, so seven in total. So within the seven, uh, and especially within the three younger members, I believe is the middle, aged one within the three younger members who was uh, when Nagendra Lakshita. So therefore, uh, in that way, you can say that the Quen family uh, contributed a lot to Tibetan Buddhism in general because he became the first, one of the first uh, Tibetans to become a monk. And so anyways, because these seven men were so successful in keeping their vows, uh, it opened up the doors for many generations, future generations of Tibetans to receive uh, for this ordination, uh, novice and full ordination vows, whether they were men or women. So, in that way, uh, their kindness was great. But because he was a monk, uh, he could not continue the family lineage, so it was his younger brother who took the responsibility to continue the family lineage. So, from Kwen Doji uh, the family lineage continued. And uh, up until Kurok Shelab Tsuching, the member known as Kurok Shelab Tsuching, uh, the members from the other family, Kun family from the 8th century up until the uh, 11th century, were followers of the ancient Nyingma tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, so that was their main practices. But then in the 11th century, there was Kuncho Gyalpo, who was the younger brother of Kurok Shela Tsuchim. And he, uh, in, it was because of his past prayers and also because uh, the time had come, the right time had come, that he understood that uh, the Sama are the new translations that should be practiced mainly. And so therefore, uh, he changed the focus of, the, of his practices. Earlier, the family's practices were the Nyingma practices, but he changed it to the Sama. So before that, they practiced many, many Nyingma practices, but um, they stopped, he stopped practicing all of the, uh, the Nyingma practices, except for the deities Yangbak and uh, Kilaya. So those practices, along with uh, the Dharma protectors related to those practices, he continued those practices. So therefore, uh, although the Kun family transitioned from the Nyingma uh, to the Sakya tradition. Uh, the lineage coming down, the Vajra Kilaya and the Yangbak uh, lineage, uh, the Dharma lineage coming down from Guru Dhamma Sambhava continues from the 8th century up until the 21st century through our uh, root groups, the Holonesses. And so therefore we are very fortunate that this lineage continues to exist. Uh, in the, the Nyingma tradition there are three the practices of the Nyingma tradition can be uh, categorized into three types, uh, Kama, Thelma, and Pagna. So Kama is the long lineage. Kama, you can basically understand it as the long lineage, the long standing lineage. Thelma is sort of like a short lineage, but uh, it's basically treasure, treasure revelation. And Pagna is, you can, you, this you can really understand as the short lineage because there doesn't need to be a, a succession of lineage masters uh, based on time. If a master has a pure vision of, um, if any master, even right now, <clears throat> if they have a pure vision of Guru Dhamma Sambhava, uh, then that is, uh, that is called pure vision. It's a very short lineage, directly from Guru Dhamma Sambhava to yourself. So that's the short lineage. So there are many practices of Vajrakilaya which are practiced within the Nyingma, and, uh, of course, uh, also nowadays, the Kagyuba tradition, the, uh, many, uh, many Kagyu sub-traditions which uh, practice Vajrakilaya and so forth. But um, mostly all of them are, belong to the Thelma uh, category. Uh, so basically what that means is that Guru Bhema Sambhava uh, taught the teaching. It was written down by his uh, disciples. It could be in the Dakini script, likely. 
and uh, then these treasures or texts were buried, sometimes in the uh, in the water, sometimes in the hills, sometimes in the forest, sometimes in, in the sky. In many places, there are many places to bury the Dharma uh, treasures. So they're buried, <clears throat> and then centuries later, uh, a Tertem or a treasure revealer will appear and uh, take out the treasure. Uh, according to the prophecy given by Guru Dhamma Sambhava. So that is um, Dharma. And most of the Vajrakilaya lineages which exist nowadays uh, certainly belong to the Dharma tradition. But the Kun, uh, the Vajrakilaya practice which the Kun family holds is the only uh, Kilaya practice which belongs to the long standing, or you could call it the Karma tradition. Because from the 8th century up until the present time, it has been passed down from generation to generation, to the Kun family mainly, so from father to son, father to son, in an uninterrupted succession. So therefore, that means the blessings are also have also been uninterrupted, and uh, therefore the accomplishment. Uh, you can, uh, if you can practice it, there are many great benefits, as the the blessings and the lineage is all intact. So this is. Um, period, the, the early period of the Nyingma, of, sorry, of the Kun family, when they practiced the Nyingma tradition. So, as I said, Kun Kondrigyabu saw the need to found a new tradition to focus the, his practices. And so he looked to the new translations which were coming down uh, from India to Tibet, actually coming up, because India is below Tibet, so coming up of, um, uh, from India to Tibet. So at that time, it was a very, you could call it a golden period for Tibetan Buddhism. There were many, many capable translators, or Lotzawas, uh, in Tibet, such as Jongmi Lotzawa, Makon Lotzawa, many famous Lotzawas. They made many great efforts um, and uh, to travel to Tibet, uh, to receive the teachings, bring it to Tibet, and, um, and then have it translated. And this uh, is very wonderful because it shows that uh, the Buddhism in Tibet is authentic because it's not something which the Tibetans created on their own. It is uh, it's something which comes from India. And India is the source of Buddhism. The Buddha attained enlightenment in India. He turned the wheel of Dharma in India. He passed away in India. So India is the main base of uh, Buddhism. It is the source of Buddhism. And it's from India that um, all of the the Buddhism spread to all of the countries uh, around the world, so therefore, and especially Asia. So therefore, it, it shows that it is all very authentic. And um, so Kun Kondrigyabo, he founded um, the first Sakya Monastery uh, in the year 1073, as I mentioned earlier, it's 1073. And uh, it was in Zhang, uh, which is uh, sort of like uh, central Tibet. And um, he, he went to this uh, place called the Bunbodi Hill. It is a hill which uh, looks like a sleeping or resting elephant. And he saw many, he saw that uh, this hill has many auspicious signs. And he thought that if I can build a monastery here, it will greatly benefit uh, sentient beings in the doctrine. So therefore, in the year 1073, he founded the first Saka monastery and thus he became the first Sakya Trijen and the founder of the Sakya tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And, um, and so this, uh, this monastery, um, it came to be called Sakya Monastery because Benburi Hill itself was named Sakya because the, the color or the texture of Benburi, the Benburi Hill was sort of grayish or white. Uh, when I asked my own teacher, King Chen Sonam Jiaozhu Rinpoche, about the meaning of um, or, you know, how to understand the, the word Sakya, and especially Balden Sakya, he first said that Sakya, Sa, he, he translates it as uh, mountain or hill, and Gya, he translates it as white, so you can understand it as white mountain. And then um, there's the word Balden. The word Balden 
when we translate it in English, it, you, we usually translate it as glorious, but um, that alone you cannot really understand its full meaning. So when we understand the word bow, then we need to break it up. In, we need to further break the two words apart, bow and then. So bow then we break it up, bow and then. So bow means a sign, a sign that there will be many siddhas and scholars, you could call it saints and scholars to appear. And then means endowed, so endowed with the signs. When you say balden, it means endowed with the signs. So balden sakya, what does that mean? White, the white mountain endowed with the signs uh, of many, many um, scholars and saints to emerge. So that's how we should understand the word uh, Balden Sakya. And as Jesuit uh, Mishitabhagyatin said, this Sakya, it, it, it looks like a lion's uh, face. So it looks like a lion's face, and uh, it is the base of Vajradhara, the Buddha Vajradhara, and it is from here all of the wishes of sentient beings are fulfilled. So it is a very holy place. It became so holy that it came to be known as um, the Bodh Gaya, it, it came to be known as the Vajrasana the Vajra seat of uh, Tibet. So when we say that, it, it, we're, sh we're showing a lot of respect to it because the Vajra seat in India is Bodh Gaya. It is the most holiest Buddhist place uh, that exists. So when we say the Vajra seat of Tibet, it, we're saying it is the most holiest place in Tibet. And this is because it is the source for all of the almost all of the great masters, not only of the Sakya tradition, but also the source of our emergence for many masters of the other traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, such as the Yingmapa, the Gaigyupa, and the Gelugpa, and Jonang, and uh, so on. So there are many, all of these traditions, the, the greatest masters of all of these traditions trained at Sakya later on. And so therefore it became like uh, the, the most important place in Tibet for studying. So to go back to Kunkuntra Gelbo, um, after he founded the, the Sakya Monastery, um, he also continued the family lineage and uh, Sacha Kumba Nyingbo was born. Uh, Sacha Kumba Nyingbo was Kunkuntra Gelbo's only son and uh, Kunkuntra Gelbo passed uh, the teachings that he had received to Sacha Kumba Nyingbo. Uh, but um, still, Sacha Kumba when Sacha Kumanyimbo was young, Kun Kuntrakyabu passed away, so he was not able to receive a great deal of teachings from his father. So therefore, Sacha Kumanyimbo's mother, um, she uh, was very wise, and she decided that the great master known as Bali Lodzawa, who was uh, also the guru of Kun Kuntrakyabu, should be invited to Sakya and uh, to hold the throne of Sakya, to become the second Sakya teacher, because Sakya himself was too young to take on that responsibility. And she wanted to appoint Bali Lodzawa as Sakya's teacher, so therefore she invited him, and uh, Bali Lodzawa arrived at Sakya and gave instructions to Sakya. And he told Sakya Kumanyimbo that uh, you are the son of a great, uh, born in a very important family, and you must grow up to become a holder of the Buddha Dharma and you must benefit sentient beings. So therefore, you need to study. In order to prepare for that, you need to study. And in order to study the Buddha Dharma, you need to have uh, wisdom. You need to have intelligence. In order to attain intelligence, the best method, although there are many methods, the best way to attain that is by relying on Manjushri, by praying to Manjushri by practicing Manjushri as he is the uh, embodiment of the wisdom of all Buddhas. So therefore he gave that advice and bestowed the initiation and uh, the teachings related to the Orient of Manjushri to Sachin. And with that he sent Sachin into retreat uh, to practice on Manjushri. And, uh, 
and in the early stages of his meditation, Saisen faced obstacles, but those obstacles were able to be removed through the practice of the Dachala. And um, he was, at that time, 11 years old, very young, 11 years old, and after about six months of meditating on Manjushri, one day Manjushri appeared, not in a dream, but directly appeared uh, in the sky in front of Sachin, uh, surrounded by two bodhisattvas. And, uh, and Manjushri was, uh, his hands were in the mudra, the Dharma Chakra mudra, the mudra turning the wheel of Dharma, and seated on a golden throne. And uh, when Manjushri appeared to Sachin, so, and he told, he gave Sachin a teaching, a very profound yet very short teaching. And um, it went something like, uh, if you are attached to this life, you are not a true spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to cyclic existence, you do not have renunciation. If you are attached to your own well-being, uh, you do not have the uh, part of enlightenment. And if you have grasping, you do not have the view. And uh, so it's one verse. And this came to be known as the mind training on parting from the four attachments. And it came to be known as the king of all mind trainings because when Sachikuma Nyingbo contemplated upon the deeper meanings of this verse, this single verse, which has four lines, he came to understand uh, that uh, this single verse encompasses the whole Sutrayana path to attaining enlightenment. All of the methods to attaining enlightenment, according to the Sutrayana tradition, or you can call it the perfection vehicle, were complete in this single verse. And so therefore it came to be known as the king of all mind trainings. <coughs> and so this is, um, in this way, such a Yingbo not only did he rely upon human gurus, but he also relied upon non-human gurus, uh, celestial gurus, such as uh, Arya Manjushri and the many Aida uh, deities which he had visions of. <coughs> and uh, so, Sachin Yingbo, like uh, his father, mainly focused on the uh, new translations, the Sama practices, and um, we call it the old, and we call it the new and old translations because uh, the way to understand this is you can understand uh, first you need to know of the translator known as uh, Rinchen Sambo, Lotsawa Rinchen Sambo. So all of, uh, generally speaking, all of the, 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 the works, the Tibetan Buddhist scriptures, and especially the Tantras, and which were translated from the Sanskrit language to Tibetan before Lord Zawad and Chinsamba's time are known as the, um, the old translations. While the translations which were translated after his time are known as the new translations. So this is how we can understand the old and new translations, the difference between the two. So he mainly focused on those, but he also continued uh, the practices of Vajrakilaya, which were the, the main families, uh, the family's main practices. So he continued those lineages and uh, he relied upon many gurus such as Ma Lodzawa and uh, Bali Lodzawa and so on. But his main guru uh, from whom he received the Lamda tradition, the Lamda teachings was uh, Shankaran Chirpa. Shankaran Chirpa. So uh, this is the Lamda is the main um, prized teaching of the Sakyabas. It comes down from Vajradhara to Vajra Nairatma, and then to those two are like the celestial Buddhas, and then down to the first human uh, guru, who was Mahasiddha Virupa, who lived in, in India around the 7th uh, and 8th century. And so from Mahasiddha Virupa, the lineage continues through a number of uh, Indian Mahasiddhas, such as uh, Kanapa, Dhammarupa, Abhaduti, Gaya, and Gayadhara. So as you can see, Masi, the Virupa, Kamapa, Dhammarupa, Abhaduti, Gayata, there's five Indian Masidas. And uh, so the Lamde three teachings came down to these five before it arrived to the Tibetan masters. And then it was received by Dongmi Lodzawa, and from there it passed on to a few generations up until it was received by Sachin Kumar Ningbo. 
So he received, Sachin received the whole Lambda uh, teachings from Shankar Chava. And uh, up until that point, the Lambda teachings were passed down, sort of, uh, uh, it was passed down orally. So there was no uh, written manuals which existed. If the, uh, so the teacher teaches the, uh, the, the instructions, uh, he passes down the instructions to the disciples, and the disciples need to remember every single detail of the, the instructions. So they need to have a very good memory. And back then, at that time, it seems to have been normal because it was better time, the ascension beings uh, had better karma and um, the masters were very holy and had excellent practices. Um, the memory always seems to have been excellent. So they were able to memorize things just by hearing the teachings once. So they had that ability back at that time. But uh, in such a point, he himself had that ability. He received the teachings and he had it memorized, and he kept it memorized, and did not write it down for many, many years. Um, but uh, eventually, he forgot the teachings due to an illness. <clears throat> he, he contracted a certain disease, and that erased all of the, the memories, all of his memories of you know, the teachings and the details of the instructions that he had received. So in that way, he felt very worried uh, for the Lamja tradition, because he was the pretty much the only uh, holder of those uh, teachings. He was the authority. He was supposed to be the authority of those teachings. But, and now that he himself had forgotten it, uh, the lineage could die out. So he considered, he first considered going to India to receive the teachings. And if there was a chance that there were any masters there who still had those teachings. But then he thought that uh, there's no certainty that I will get what I am so, that I will find what I'm searching for once I make it there. So then he, instead of going to India, he stayed, he continued to stay, to stay in Sakya, and he meditated uh, and prayed to, fervently prayed to his gurus. And by fervently praying to his gurus, he had a vision, he had dreams and visions, direct visions of his gurus, and the guru who had bestowed the Lamja teachings upon him appeared in front of him in his vision, and gave the teachings to him once again. And in that way, he had he got the chance to receive the teachings all over again. But uh, what's even more interesting is that uh, when he continued, after he received those teachings from his guru to his visions, uh, he did not stop. He continued to uh, pray even uh, more. And uh, due to that, Masida Virupa appeared uh, in front of him. Uh, Masida Virupa, to Sachin, surrounded with four other Indian Masidas. <coughs> and these five Indian Masidas appeared to Sachin, and um, then Masida Virupa gave the teachings on the Lamdre to Sachin directly. So this is very interesting because Masida Virupa was a master who lived around the 7th and 8th century in India. And when we're speaking about Sachin's time, Sachin was born in the late. Uh, late 11th century and he lived most of his life in the early 12th century so he, as you can see Masada Virupa sort of transversed time and space and came to Saka to bestow the teachings to Satan and it is said that uh, Masada Virupa just like a but just as almost as if he belonged to that century to the 12th century he stayed with Satan for a duration of one month at Saka so during that time Master the Virupa gave him teachings in the morning, and in the afternoon, in the night. They would have meals together, and for a duration of one month, the teacher and disciple, uh, they uh, spent time like that. And, uh, and in that way, Sachin uh, received all of the teachings all over again, and became the complete authority of the Lamdri tradition. But he understood that if the Lamdri was to continue to be orally passed, uh, it would be difficult to say that uh, the Lamde would uh, survive at all because he understood that future generations will not have this uh, ability to uh, retaining the teachings in their minds. So he therefore, finally, after many years, had uh, he wrote down the manuals. Uh, he wrote down the first instruction. He wrote it uh, uh, related to the Lamde on paper and uh, had those written down. And so it was uh, from there on practiced and uh, we should feel very grateful to him for that kindness. 
And so that is uh, a bit about such. And it is said that with, at the moment he passed away, he emanated his body into four different bodies. And these four different bodies uh, departed to four different pure lives. So he was a great master. He was, in fact, an emanation of Avalokiteshvara. And, this, and by that, he had uh, uh, fulfilled the prophecy of Atisha, the Indian master Atisha, because before Kun Gonchukyalbo had bought the land of Sakya, um, several decades before Kun Gonchukyalbo had done that, the Indian master known as Atisha uh, visited Sakya. He was on his tour in Tibet and he happened to uh, arrive at Sakya. And at that time, there was no monastery, it was just an empty land, an empty hill. And uh, when he arrived at Sakya, uh, he saw on the hill of Sakya that there was um, seven B syllables, one Shi syllable, and one Hum syllable. And uh, one, at the, right after he saw that, he prostrated towards the hill, and he set up many offerings in front of the hill. Uh, even if, to this day in Tibet, in Sakya, we have this area called Chatsalgang. Chatsalgang. So Chatsalgang means the area where Atisha prostrated. The prostration area, that's what it means, Chatsalgang. And so he prostrated and um, the, that confused and puzzled his disciples, uh, the Indian Pandita's who were accompanying him from India. They asked him, why are you prostrating to this empty land? What is the purpose of this? Uh, you know, something like that. And he said, uh, look, look over there. In Tibetan, it's called Singha. Singha, so look over there. And, even, uh, and so he says, Singha, look over there. Do you not see on that hill that there are seven B syllables, one Shi syllable and one Hum syllable? And that is a sign that in the future, at this place, there will emerge seven emanations of Manjushri, one emanation of Avalokiteshvara, and one emanation of Vajrapani, and they will greatly benefit sentient beings. And he also says that there are two yaks um, grazing uh, on the lands uh, below the hill of Sakya, and that is a sign that in the future there will be the activity of two Mahakalas in this area, and the two Mahakalas later turned out to be Banjaranatha Mahakala, which we call Kurgi Gombo, and Chaturmukha Mahakala, the four-faced Mahakala. So those two became the main protectors of the Sakya tradition. And so in that way, um, Saj Kumanyangu fulfilled the prophecy of Atisha, as he was the emanation of Avalokiteshvara. She is the seed syllable of Avalokiteshvara, the is the seed syllable of Manjushri, and Hum is the seed syllable of Vajrapani. So Saji Kumanyangu himself was uh, mainly an emanation of Avalokiteshvara, but he was also an emanation of Manjushri as well, and uh, Master Dabirupas also. And it was such as descendants, uh, such as his son, Sonam Tsenmo, Champa Gyaltsen, and so on, and Sakya Pandita, Shrikam Papa, they were all emanations of Manjushri. And um, there are seven in total. And, uh, and then down the line, there is one man known as in short, Dogen Chana. His full name is Chana Doje. Same name as Vajrapani. In Tibetan, we call Vajrapani Chana Doje. So he had the same name because he was an emanation of Vajrapani. So uh, in this way, uh, there was a prophecy regarding the, uh, the Kremlin members of. Uh, the current members are being emanations of the three Buddha families. So this is important. All of the qualities of the Buddha are categorized into three different types. Uh, of course, the Buddhas have many, many different qualities, but the main three qualities of the Buddhas, of all Buddhas, are their compassion, their wisdom, and their power. So the embodiment of the compassion of all Buddhas is Avalokiteshvara. The embodiment of their wisdom is Manjushri. And the embodiment of the power is Vajrapani. And the embodiment of these qualities of the Buddhas are the current family members. So that is how it should be understood. And so, um, 
not only that, but when Sachi Pumanyimbo received the uh, teachings from Manjushri on parting from the four attachments, he also had a vision that uh, from Manjushri's part, seven swords um, came out from his heart and dissolved into Sachi Pumanyimbo himself. So seven swords from Manjushri's heart shot out from his heart and dissolved into Sachi. And uh, Sachi took this as a sign that all of his own descendants, his family descendants, would be emanations of uh, Manjushri. So that those are the prophecies sort of regarding the, uh, uh, the family lineage. And also there are also many prophecies uh, regarding the current family lineage given by Guru Dhamma Sambhava. Uh, you can find it in the condensed Gathang, the Gathang Pipa, which is the condensed uh, Gathang. There are prophecies regarding Shrigal Papa as an emanation of Guru Dhamma Sambhava himself. And actually, um, there are prophecies scattered around in the different Nyingmapa uh, treasures. And there are prophecies regarding all five of the uh, founding members, such as Kuan Yingbo, Salam Sanu, Haba Gyaltsen, Saki Benita, and Shrigal Papa that were given by Guru Dhamma Sambhava. And as for the Sakyaka tradition, there is a prophecy which we believe, and many scholars believe, a, a prophecy of, um, of the emergence of the Sakya tradition given by Buddha Shakyamuni himself. Uh, it's, this prophecy can be found in the, uh, the, in the teaching given by the Buddha known as the Manjushri Mulakalpa, the Manjushri Mulakalpa. And in, the, in, it, uh, in Tibetan it goes, Henei Gesava Ka Kambodhava Jebata. So it can be translated as the letters Sa and Ka are stated in the beginning. So the true letters Sa and Ka. The letters Sa and Ka are stated in the beginning. And this was taught by Shakyamuni Buddha. And many of the Tibetan, the majority of Tibetan uh, masters uh, interpreted this uh, prophecy as the Buddha's prophecy of uh, the founding of the Sakya tradition. Yeah. Uh, this is also mentioned by the late Chokitijan Rinpoche in one of his works that uh, many of the masters uh, say or interpreted, uh, interpret this uh, prophecy by the Buddha as a prophecy uh, related to the Sakya tradition. So, <clears throat> coming back to Sachin Kuan Yibo, his main son, he had four sons, but the most two famous were Sonam Zenmo and Tapa Gyalsen. And uh, Sonam Zenmo was a very extraordinary being because um, from the very time he was born, at the moment he was born, the Daginis in uh, India immediately wrote uh, right above the gate of the Mahabodhi temple, uh, where Buddha Shakyamuni and Himalayas were that every after this uh, main stupa there. If many of, uh, if many of you have uh, made a pilgrimage there, you will see a, a very long uh, stupa which contains a very beautiful statue of Buddha Shakyamuni in the lotus. So above the gate, uh, on the entrance door to that temple, the Dakinis wrote um, that on this day, an emanation of Manjushri has been born in Sakya, in Tibet. And they sort of uh, spread the word in that way. So therefore, whenever the Indian Panditas would enter the temple to pay homage to the Buddha in practice, they would see that inscription. So in that way, uh, all of the Benditas living in the Bodh Gaya area and surrounding areas in India knew about um, Sonam Temu's birth and knew that he was an emanation of Manjushri. And, uh, Manjush uh, and Sonam Temu, he, like his father, also had many visions of the masters, non-human masters, such as Manjushri, Hevajra, Master the Virupa, and so forth, directly. And, um, he would be able to travel across um, the different uh, pure lands, such as Sangha Bali and Potala, the, um, not the one in Tibet, but the one, uh, the main, the original Potala, the pure land of Avalokiteshvara, um, and so forth. He could travel to all of those pure lands in one day, which at that time was not possible for any ordinary beings who had not attained a high realization. And, um, but he, um, 
focused his life mainly on studies and practice. He, uh, the, are different sayings whether he became the Sakya Tong holder or not, but uh, we can say that he did. According to the current uh, calculation system, uh, which Gana Vajra Rinpoche is the 43rd Sakya Tungzin, Sonam Simul is counted as the Sakya Tungzin, he is counted as the 4th Sakya Tungzin. But uh, there are traditions which do not count him as the Sakya Tungzin, uh, saying that he did not serve as the Sakya Tungzin, and there are also different uh, versions of the story where some say he served for 13 years, some say he served for less, even less years as a Sakya Tunzin and so forth. So there are many different accounts. But anyways, it's very clear that he did not serve as a Tunzin for too long. He passed the uh, responsibilities of the tone holdership to his younger brother, Tapak Yalsen, and he himself focused on practicing the Dharma and learning, uh, particularly uh, dialectics. Uh, and so at the end of uh, you cannot really say, but um, the, at the time he left this earth, you can put it that way, he did not leave his body behind. Uh, he levitated up into the sky with his body, and uh, he just went higher and higher and up and disappeared. And in that way, he traveled to Kechari, the pure land of Bajra Yogini. So therefore, we cannot say that Sonal Temur died. Uh, usually, in his biography, or in the in, in the writings, when we mention Sonan Semo, we will put the year, uh, his birth year and his death year. We just put that death year as, uh, as a time in which we know that he left Earth, but uh, it's not really a death year. We cannot say he died. Because to die, what, what does dying mean? Dying is basically the moment when the mind and the body is separated. But that did not happen for him. He went with his body to Kichari. So therefore, it is said that um, in the um, if the masters go to Kechari, and he also went to Amitabha's pure land, according to other versions. So, when the masters uh, are, when, are when sentient beings or people are reborn uh, from this life, and they are reborn in the pure land, such as Amitabha's pure land or Kechari, uh, you cannot recognize many of the masters there because they have taken a different body, a different birth there. So like uh, sometimes such Huanyingbo, some masters there may not be recognizable. But Sonam Zemo looks the same as he was when he was living, so because he did not change the body. So if you go to the Pure Land later, you will find that Sonam Zemo is there just as he was when he was living in Saka. He has the same body, no change. And so that is a bit about Sonam Zemo. Then his younger brother, Tapa Gyalzen. Tapa Gyalzen was considered as the greatest saint of uh, Buddhism at this time. Um, because not only was he the greatest saint of, uh, the greatest Tibetan Buddhist saint, but he was also, also recognized by the masters of Indian Buddhism uh, to be the greatest saint of um, Buddhism in general, because they said that even in, even in India, we do not have a Buddhist saint like you. Uh, this was said by um, Kashmiri Pandita, Shakeshri Badra, who was the last uh, abbot of Nalendra University in India. Because it was around this time that the very famous um, university, the Buddhist university called Nalendra, was invaded by uh, Turkish Muslim invaders and looted. And uh, many of the monks and the students there died, and uh, many had to flee. And uh, the whole library was burnt, uh, was completely burnt. The library was said to be so great that it took many, many months for all of the textbooks, the scriptures contained within the library to be destroyed. So uh, at that time, around that time, Nalanda University was destroyed. So um, before it was destroyed, it's, there was an abbot and his name was Kashmiri Bandita, Shakishri Badra. Shakishri Badra is his main name. And, uh, we call him Kashmiri Pandita because he is from the land known as Kashmir. And uh, he was the last abbot, and he is the last because following him, there was no one to succeed him as the home holder of Nalanda because Nalanda was destroyed during his lifetime. So he is the last abbot, and uh, he was invited to Tibet by Trogu Lodzawa, Jambebal. And um, Trogu Lodzawa invited him, and um, that greatly benefited Sakya Pandita, who was the nephew of Tapa Gyalsen. 
um, because um, with Kashmiri Pandita's arrival in Tibet, Sakya Pandita could learn Buddhism directly from the Indian masters without actually having to make the effort to go to India. So it made it very easy for him. And from Kashmiri Pandita, Sakya Pandita received many teachings and so forth, uh, which we will uh, get back to later. But anyways, uh, Kashmiri Pandita visited Sakya. So he visited Sakya and stayed at Sakya for uh, a period of time. And um, he stayed with Jizan Thapa Gyalsen and his Thapa Gyalsen's nephew Sakya Pandita. And during that time, he mainly was serving as the tutor of Sakya Pandita. And um, so once it was said that um, Kashmiri Pandita uh, prophesied, or you could say, uh, predicted, maybe predicted is a better word to use, he predicted that there would be an eclipse on this day, on a certain day. So he said there would be, on this day, on this, at this time, there will be an eclipse. Eclipse will occur. But uh, Jizu Thapa said, no, it will not occur. He, he disagreed with Kashmiri Benita. And Kashmiri Benita was a scholar. He knew how to look at when the eclipses would occur. He knew astrology. But Jizu Thapa said, no, it's not going to happen. And uh, just as Jizu Thapa Gyatsen said, on the day that uh, Kashmiri Benita had uh, predicted that it would happen, it did not occur. Because Jizu Thapa Gyatsen, through the meditation of his winds, uh, prevented it from occurring. So, in that way, uh, it, was, it was sort of like uh, Jizun Thapa would tease uh, the Kashmiri Pandita a bit. But uh, what is even more amazing is that once um, Kashmiri Pandita, while he was with Sakya Pandita, he told him, what is your uncle doing? What is he up to? And Saben told him, he's uh, doing his practices. He's performing his meditations at the moment. And uh, Kashmiri Pandita said, then let's go see him. Let's pay him a visit. So they, they went to his room, Sakya Pandita, Sakya Pandita said, let me go ahead, and you follow. So Satan went ahead, and Kashmiri Pandita followed. And when Kashmiri Pandita entered the room of Jizu Thapa Gyatsen, uh, Jizu Thapa Gyatsen was very deep in meditation, uh, in his Vajrayana meditation on the deities, and uh, particularly Gwaya Samaja, and so on. So he was very deep in his meditation, but he noticed that Kashmiri Pandita had entered his room, and he thought to himself that he, Kashmiri Pandita, is a very well-respected uh, master from India, and so it would be improper if I do not get up uh, to show my respects to him. So at that time, when he was thinking that, Jizan Thapa Gyalsen was, uh, he was, uh, as he was in the middle of his practices, he was holding the Vajra and Del, he was using that. But he, he, he needed to get up, so in his haste, uh, he got up, but he forgot to place the Vajra and Bell on the table, so he, he left it on space. He placed the Vajra and Bell in space, and in the space the Vajra and Bell was just hanging in space. And when Kashmiri Pandita saw that, he was truly amazed. And all of his doubts regarding Jizan Thapa Gyatsen were dispelled, and he immediately at that moment prostrated to Jizan Thapa Gyatsen. And um, this displeased uh, his Kashmiri Pandita's Indian students and disciples. Uh, because in India, there wasn't really a tradition for monks to prostrate to laymen, lay people. And of course, no need to say for a great master such as Kashmiri Pandita, who was the abbot of Nalanda, to prostrate to a, um, a Tibetan lay person. Actually, they had an agreement when they first came from India to Tibet that. When we come to Tibet, uh, we are not going to show respect or you know, show any kind of honor such as prostration to any Tibetans, uh, because we, you know, we have you know, some uh, dignity to uh, God. So we need to keep our dignity as a great Indian master, uh, Indian master. So we don't, we should not prostrate to Tibetans. But Kashmiri Pandita did not keep that promise. The moment he saw Jizan Thapa placing the Vajra and in space. He broke the promise to prostrate it immediately. And they asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, why not? He is not an ordinary person. He is Gwaya Samaja, the deity Gwaya Samaja, or the Buddha Gwaya Samaja himself. And so in this way, <coughs> uh, 
from this story, I believe that it can also be said that um, this tradition in which monks and nuns and ordained members prostrate to lay uh, people, lay gurus, of course there's no need to prostrate to general lay people, but lay people who are one's gurus, it wasn't created by um, Tibetans themselves. Uh, this is a story in which the Indian masters, even the abbot of Nalanda did, an abbot of Nalanda postulated to the Tonkot of Sakya, and who was a lay person. So this is an example uh, that if your guru is a Buddha, even if he's a lay person and you are a monk, you should postulate. If he is um, not your guru, then of course there's no need to show uh, such great extent of respect. And it's mainly the responsibility for lay people to show respect to the ordained ones. But when it comes to Vajrayana, there's nothing higher than the Guru. The Guru is more important than the Buddha, because although the Buddha's kindness was great for teaching the Dharma, the Guru's kindness is even greater, because the Guru has directly cared for the disciple, has directly cared for you, has directly given you the teachings. The Buddha has not directly given you the teachings. You have his teachings available to you, but he will not guide you step by step, because we are living in different times. He has already passed away. We are living as his uh, followers in a different time. So, but the gurus are present. And we should remember this. Uh, we have His Holiness the 41st Sangha Komachizhen Chen, His Holiness the 42nd Komachizhen Chen here in the Kutal Sen, so lucky we are to have that and to, to receive this uh, teachings, many teachings for one whole week. So we should keep this in mind that their kindness is even greater than the gurus greater than the Buddhas. And uh, if we can rely on these Gurus, uh, if we can put our full devotion and trust in these Gurus, enlightenment can be attained very swiftly, even in one lifetime. That just mainly depends upon the disciples' faith, devotion, and uh, pure vision. It's said that if you see the Guru it's a saying by Sakyapendita, that if you see the Guru as a Buddha, you will receive the blessings of a Buddha. If you, if you see the Guru as an Arahat, you will receive the blessings of an Arahat. But if you see the Guru as an ordinary sentient being, you will not receive any blessings at all. So therefore, it's important to train our minds in seeing the Guru as the Buddha. It can be Buddha Vajradhara, or even if you cannot, even if it's too difficult to visualize the Guru in the Buddha's form, you can at least visualize that the Guru's mind is actually the Buddha, but he is appearing in human form. That is better than nothing. So we basically need to get our minds, uh, to train our minds in thinking in such a way. It's not easy in the beginning. Of course, uh, it's not easy for everyone, but uh, once you get accustomed to it, just as Shantideva said, um, once you get accustomed to something, it will, there's nothing that uh, remains that is uh, difficult. So everything that we consider difficult, once we get used to it, it eventually becomes easy to do. So that uh, is what we should keep in mind. <clears throat> uh, so then, anyways, um, back to Jizun Tapa. He was truly an ordin extraordinary being because it is said that every single day he would meditate on se over 70 mandalas. Uh, the, the mandalas is like the celestial palace, the, uh, the celestial abode of the Buddhas, the, the different deities, the different tantras. So this is very difficult because as ordinary beings, we can hardly meditate on even one mandala. And of course in the mandala, as you can see, it's like a, it's a, it's a diagram, it's a, it's a circular diagram with many details. It has the palace, it has the deities within, uh, living within the palace, and so forth. So it's a very complicated uh, visualization you need to do, but he would do every single day, uh, he would meditate on 70 mandalas, all them 70, so that's something not, that uh, ordinary beings cannot do. And so that is a bit about Jizun Tapa Gyaltsen, and then we have his disciple, Sakyapai Dada, who is the most famous um, Khan family member. And um, he was truly an emanation of Manjushri. 
it is said that for his past 25 lives, for the uh, past 25 lives, he had been directly cared, by, uh, cared for by Arya Manjushri himself. So Arya Manjushri had given teachings to Sakya Pandita in his past two lives. And in this life, he appeared as, into the Kran family as uh, Sakya Pandita Kungar Gyaltsen. And there's something very special about him because in this era, in our time, there have been only three uh, individuals or three people or three historical figures who have appeared uh, born with the 32 major and 80 minor signs of a fully enlightened Buddha. Two of them were from um, what we can call India. Uh, at that time it was India, but now we can say it's one of us from Nepal. So Shakyamuni Buddha who was born in Lumbini. Uh, he was born in current present day Nepal, Nubini. So he was the first one in this era to be born in our world with the 32 major and 80 minor signs of a Buddha, which basically means you have the Ushnisha um, and you have the, the white curled hair between the eyebrows and you have the um, sort of like a, the Madama Chakra, uh, the image of the Dhamma Chakra on both your hands and your feet. Have very long nail, uh, very, sorry, very long fingers, and um, the nails are pinkish red and so forth. So there are many, and there's a lot to count. But anyways, Shakyamuni Buddha was the first. Um, if you can just look at the paintings and the statues of Buddha, you'll find that he doesn't look like ordinary people. There's something different about him. So, li so likewise, um, the second person to appear in this world with such signs was uh, Arya Nagarjuna was born in India, and uh, so he had these signs. And then the third person, and so far the last person to appear um, with these signs, was born in Tibet, and he was Sakyapendita. So Sakyapendita had all of these signs. You usually don't see the Vishnisha, you know, the, the hair, it's not really hair, but it's the Vishnisha, above because it's covered with a Sakya hat, so you don't find that often, but uh, he has that. And, but we often uh, clearly have the white um, um, curled hair between the eyebrows when we paint him or his statues. It's there. And so um, he had these signs. So no other master has had signs, such signs, uh, that was born in Tibet. And um, as I mentioned, he trained on the Kashmiri Pentadai. He wrote. Uh, from the, actually, from the, very, from the very beginning, since the time he was born, he knew Sanskrit. He did not need to learn Sanskrit because in his past 25 lives, he had learned, he, he was uh, extremely, uh, he extremely, uh, he knew Sanskrit extremely well. And so he did not need to learn it in this life because he had, he remembered all of the things that he had learned in his past life. So, um, therefore, when, when, when he learned um, the subject that we call Tsema, Epistemology from um, uh, Kashmiri Vendita, he later wrote his own work known as The Treasury of Valid Cognition. We call it Valid Cognition. So he wrote this uh, in Tibetan, but it was, and it was so beautifully written, it was so wonderful that it impressed the Indian Venditas, and they brought it to Tibet, uh, from Tibet to India, and they decided to translate it from the Tibetan to Sanskrit language. So, in that way, the Sakyapendita's work known as Treasury of Valid Cognition became the first Tibetan work to be translated from Tibetan to Sanskrit. Usually the works, majority, 99% of the scriptures are translated from Sanskrit to Tibetan. But this is the first case uh, in which as Tibetan was translated to Sanskrit language. And uh, he also wrote many other beautiful works such as uh, the um, Treasury of Good Advice, uh, which anyone, anyone can learn if they want to live a good lifestyle, whether they are Buddhist or not. And then, of course, he wrote um, the text known as The Differentiation of the Three Vows, which we call Thomson, about the age. So, Differentiation of the Three Vows. This text clearly differentiates what is the correct Dharma and what is the incorrect Dharma. Because during his time, in Sakyabhinita's time, there were many incorrect Dharma practices which were being propagated in Tibet. So he needed to stop those practices uh, so that those, the wrong views would not increase and, uh, and the Dharma 
but the Dharma will not be further corrupted. So he wrote this textbook. And, uh, and so in this way, his kindness was great. Around that time, there was an Indian non-Buddhist master known as Harinanda. And uh, Harinanda was threatening Buddhism because uh, it so happened that not only was Harinanda uh, greatly skilled in magical power, but he was also a great scholar, um, a great intellectual. So no Pandita, no Indian Pandita living in India was able to defeat uh, Harinanda to reason. And uh, in, Indian Buddhism was sort of dying out due to that as well, meanwhile. And um, no one could show up. Like, he was open to being challenged by the Buddhist masters, uh, the scholars. But uh, no Indian Buddhist showed up to challenge him. Uh, but then, because Sakipendita was uh, such a great master and his fame was spreading in Tibet, Harinanda heard of that. And he um, became a bit jealous of Sakyapendita, and he wanted to challenge Sakyapendita. And so uh, Harinanda and uh, Sakyapendita met at, uh, at Hirong, uh, the border, uh, sort of between India and Tibet. So they met at the border. And um, it's, this is quite interesting because uh, it seems that Harinanda arrived at the border first. And uh, Sakyapendita came later, but uh, Sakyapendita's disciples were sent earlier uh, to arrange for the debate between the two masters. And uh, when they, the disciples came, when Sakyapendita's disciples came, they weren't walking. They were sitting on clouds in the sky, and uh, the clouds were their sort of like vehicle. So these disciples, uh, Sakyapendita monks, were sitting on the clouds, and they came and uh, sort of landed at the debate ground. And the moment they saw this, many of Harinanda's disciples became so frightened, and they thought, oh, for sure, our teacher is going to lose this debate. Uh, there's no chance he can win. Just look at the so-called Sakyapendita's disciples. If they are like this, then the master must be even greater. So it is said that Harinanda's own disciples left the debate ground, uh, losing hope even before the debate started. And so later, Sakyapendita arrived, and they debated for a long time. And, uh, event, and when they debated, they had a promise. They made an agreement that if Sakyapendita um, won the debate, Harinanda would uh, abandon his beliefs, his religion, and would become a Buddhist. But if uh, Sakyapendita were to lose the debate, Sakyapendita must abandon Buddhism and enter into um, Harinanda's uh, non-Buddhist tradition. And uh, they both agreed upon it, and they debated. And in the end, uh, with the assistance of Manjushri, um, Sakyapendita won the debate, and Harinanda became a, um, a Buddhist. And so this, in this way, Sakyapendita's kindness was great, because uh, if Sakyapendita had not debated with Harinanda, Harinanda would have entered Tibet, uh, and, you know, the whole Tibetan region would have um, been transformed from a Tibetan, from, sorry, from Buddhism to Hinduism. Uh, because um, if there's nobody to challenge him, there's nobody to stop him. So he can do what he wishes. So um, in that way, there was a whole moment at a time in Tibet when Buddhism almost became a Hindu, uh, you know, uh, its religion almost became Hinduism. Sakyapendita prevented that. And when the Penditas, when the Indian masters heard that Sakyapendita had won the debate, they became so grateful to Sakyapendita that even though you know, they were living far away, they could not see Sakyapendita, they all faced towards Tibet. They knew where Tibet was, where Tibet, which direction Tibet lied. And they faced Tibet and they prostrated and threw flowers towards uh, Tibet out of gratitude. And later, uh, in Sakyapendita's life, um, the prince, Mongolian prince Gordan Khan invited Sakyapendita to the Mongol court because it was at this time that the Mongol em empire was at its height and it was uh, growing and it was um, not too long after uh, Genghis Khan's passing. So there was Genghis Khan's uh, descendants such as Gordan Khan and, uh, and uh, Kublai Khan and they were all there. And, um, 
So the Mongol Empire, it was growing in many surrounding lands uh, in Mongolia. Many lands surrounding Mongolia were uh, being conquered by Mongolia. And uh, Tibet also uh, was in a very difficult position. And there was uh, no hope for Tibetans to fight the Mongols because they were so powerful. So, but Godan Khan, uh, he was a very wise person. He, want, he wanted to learn the Bauma. So he sent an invitation letter to Saki Benita saying that I need a guide for myself and my subjects to show us the right path of the Buddha. And so will you be my guide? And uh, if you do agree, please do come to my court, uh, my palace, to teach me. If you do not agree, he said, I will send my troops to Tibet and it will destroy the monasteries and kill innocents. So it was also a threatening letter. So Sakya Pendita, out of his great compassion, made the long trip from Sakya to uh, the Pangu kingdom, uh, Shisha at that time, uh, which was uh, Lanzhou. Uh, so he made his trip there. It took several years, about three years, I believe, um, because at that time, there was no easy or quick travel mode. So. But on the way, he, he went in a very comfortable way because he stopped at different places, gave teachings, made connections with the people, and um, taught the Dharma. So it took quite a long time. And once he arrived there, <coughs> he taught um, the king, uh, so the prince Kodanka, and um, the Dharma. And in that way, <coughs> uh, he turned the Mongol uh, sort of like uh, people into followers of the Buddhism, because the Mongol people were sort of like uh, barbarians uh, who had no rules to follow and uh, were very ferocious, uh, scary. So uh, he turned them all into the majority into Buddhist uh, followers. And in the end, um, Sakya Pendita did not return to Sakya. He did not return to Tibet. He passed away in Lanza. So even now, uh, there. If you go there, there are pilgrimage places related to Sakya Pendita. Sakya Pendita's Parinirvana uh, Stupa, or the Momo, or you could call it Memorial Stupa, is uh, there. And there are uh, many different uh, places uh, which you can still see where Sakya Pendita uh, initiated the prince and taught the Dharma and benefits sentient beings. And so there are several monuments there uh, which can still be recognized. And um, and so that is about Sakya Pendita. And um, his life story is uh, very great and uh, very detailed, very beautiful, uh, but we do not have the time to cover it all. So continuing with that, Sakya Pendita's successor and his uh, nephew was Chögyal Palpa. And um, because Chögyal Palpa had traveled with Sakya Pendita, along with the Dokken Chana Bodje, the member of of Vajrapani, which I mentioned earlier, to Godan Khan's court. Uh, they made connections with the royal family there, and um, Kublai Khan uh, also knew uh, Papa, uh, Papa Ramachir, because uh, Kublai Khan himself had received a number of teachings from Sakya Benita, but uh, now that Sakya Benita had passed away, uh, he wanted to also rely on a guru, so he said, he asked for Chögya Papa to serve as his guru, and Chögya Papa agreed. And uh, in that way, the priest and patron relationship continued. And uh, <clears throat> um, Chögyal Papa bestowed the He Vajra empowerment uh, to Kublai Khan three times, a total of three times. And uh, <clears throat> out of gratitude, um, Kublai Khan offered in return the title of uh, state preceptor and so on seals, uh, and also he offered to the, the land, the, the entire region of Tibet, the entire Tibetan land, our country, to Chögyal Papa, making Chögyal Papa the ruler of Tibet, with the support of the Mongol uh, royal family, particularly Kublai Khan. And, um, and also Kublai Khan offered the conch shell, the white conch shell, very famous white conch shell to Chögyal Papa, and 
uh, this is the conch shell which uh, Lord Indra, the king of the gods, had offered to Buddha Shakyamuni following Buddha Shakyamuni's uh, attainment of enlightenment. Because um, after Buddha Shakyamuni attained enlightenment, as uh, the 42nd Komachinsen, which is said during the Nonna, that uh, for about seven weeks, which is uh, 49 days, the Buddha did not teach the Dharma. So, because he thought that, you know, uh, the realization I have attained is so profound and deep that if I were to share it with others, people would likely not understand it and appreciate it. So I'll just uh, rather not teach it. So, Brahma and Indra, Brahma is the Lord of the gods, and Indra is the king of the gods. They understood the Buddha's thoughts and they came down from the heavens, Indra holding a white conch shell and Brahma holding a thousand spoke golden wheel. They offered these two gifts to the Buddha and requested the Buddha to turn the wheel of Dharma. And following that, it was finally that, due to that that the Buddha agreed and headed for Varanasi and then taught, uh, turned the wheel of Dharma for the first time by teaching the Four Noble Truths. So in that way, uh, uh, the conch shell, it was used by the Buddha during the Buddha, when the Buddha gave sermons, it was used to gather the disciples around when the Buddha gave teachings. Later on, it was passed down to Indian kings, and then it came to um, the China eventually, and uh, and to, to Kublai Khan in that way eventually. So Kublai Khan got it, and he received it, and he offered it to Chagya Papa. And also Chagya Papa was very kind uh, to the uh, people of uh, China, because uh, at that time there was uh, the sort of Chinese genocide by throwing people into the river to reduce the population because it was so large. But he said that this is this practice should not be followed, and uh, he says uh, great non-virtue by doing so. So uh, Kublai Khan agreed, and the practice uh, sort of practices were <laughs> put to a halt, and in that way many lives were saved. And um, also, as the ruler of Tibet, he was kind to the Tibetan people. He uh, ruled uh, the Tibetan people accordingly, in accord with the Dharma, the law of the Dharma. And, uh, and uh, he was the first king, you could, or ruler, you could say, uh, of course, with the support under the Mongol Empire. Uh, he was the first ruler of Tibet. Uh, we call it Chugya. Dharma king. So he was the first Dharma king uh, to look after the Tibetans, uh, to look after the Tibetan region, following uh, Lang Dharma, uh, the, the Tibetan king known as Lang Dharma, who uh, destroyed Buddhism. Um, Lang Dharma was from the family of uh, the actual, the original royal family, but um, because of his past prayers, he sort of undid whatever the his, predece his predecessors, or ancestors, such as Sonsen Gambo and Chison Detsin and Tri Rabachan, what those Dharma kings did, he undid. He, and um, he brought chaos to the Tibetan region. And uh, he closed the um, Buddhist temples and so on, and stopped many Buddhist practices. And, um, and so following that, there was no Tibetan ruler. Uh, and Chukya Papa was the first. So in that way, Chagya Papa's kindness was great. And uh, also, uh, he, as the ruler of Tibet, he had as his audience all of the Tibetans. And uh, many, many people, many, many Tibetans received uh, full ordination vows. Uh, many men and women received full ordination vows from him. It is said that in Chagya Papa's lifetime, from the beginning up until end, he had given about the full ordination vows to about around uh, 400,025 people. That is a lot of uh, people. And uh, also, uh, his own disciple, one of his own disciples, had given uh, full ordination vows to around 900 uh, Chinese disciples. So, in that way, the ordination lineage of Chagya Papa. Which comes through psychedelic uh, continued and spread uh, not only in Tibet but also in the Yuan Empire, to say. 
And so that is um, the life of Che Papa. He did not live too long. But anyways, these were all members of the Kun family. And from there on, for almost around a century, uh, the Kun family ruled uh, Tibet <coughs> with the uh, support of the Mongol Empire. And um, so up until around the time of um, the, the Kun master known as Sangopa, the family was known as the general um, Kun family. But following Sangopa, because the, the Kun family was dying out around his time, and he was the only uh, member left from the family, uh, and as he was uh, commanded by the emperor, the successor to Kublai Khan, who was Emperor Timur Khan, uh, Emperor Timur Khan had told um, Sangopa to marry uh, and uh, to produce many sons to continue the family lineage and to serve as the throne holder of Sakya. And so likewise, it just as uh, commanded, uh, Dany uh, fulfilled that wish of the king or the emperor. And he had many, many sons, many children. And uh, from these children, four palaces were divided. The Shitok Palace, the Rinchenkang Palace, the Lakang Palace, and the Future Palace. And um, the Shito Palace were one of the, was the shortest remaining palace. It did not last too long, but it seems that uh, many of the throne holders of Sakya in the early period were from that palace, the Shito Palace. And uh, then there was the Rinchenkan Palace, which lasted a little longer than the Shito Palace. Uh, there were fam famous members such as Lama Thamba and Solam Gyaltsen. He was one of the most famous members from that palace. And uh, he was the 14th Sakya throne holder. And uh, as I said earlier, Baldin Sakya is a source for not only Sakya masters, but masters uh, for producing, responsible for producing masters from all Buddhist traditions. And uh, we can understand from the life story of Lama Thamba Sonam Gyalsen, because Lama Thamba Sonam Gyalsen was the guru of the fourth Kamapa, Lord the Doji. Kamakagi tradition. He was the guru of Situ Chanchu Gyaltsen uh, from the Paltukagi tradition. And Situ Chanchu Gyaltsen was uh, the, the one who took, uh, who usually we say took the power of uh, the Tibetan power from Sakya. So after the Sakya was ruled of Tibet, it was the Pagdu, the Pamadrupas, who ruled Tibet. The Pamadrupa was the ruling power, uh, power of Tibet. But uh, there's uh, more research is on this is needed because um, if you look at it, um, Sintu Changju Gyaltsen was a disciple of the Sakyapas. So he did not really mean harm to the Sakyapas. Uh, we even have a saying that if Lama Thamba was actually became the ruler of Tibet, Sintu Changju Gyaltsen would have been okay with it. He was okay with his guru becoming the ruler, but he was not okay with anyone else uh, from the Sakya family becoming the ruler of Tibet. So therefore, because Lama Thamba was not interested in politics, and he was only interested in the Dharma, uh, Siddhi Chandra Gyatsen took over in, uh, the ruling power. So anyways, he was the disciple of Lama Thamba. And then uh, there was also the famous uh, author of the 37 Practices of a Bodhisattva, Jasun Muchupalme. He was also a disciple of Lama Thamba. And uh, <clears throat> of course, all of the current family members around that time were disciples of Lama Thamba. And um, also uh, from the Giluk tradition, the founder of the Giluk school, Jetsongkapa, uh, Yotsongkapa. So he was also a disciple of Lama Thamba Sonam Gyaltsen. So all of these masters uh, were disciples of Lama Thamba. So he can be considered as a truly non sectarian master. <clears throat> And uh, so he is from the Rinchenkang Palace. Continuing uh, with that, there is the Lakang Palace. And one of the most famous members from the Lakang Palace is Heichen Chuji from Gadashi. So Heichen Chuji, his name in short is Heichen Chuji. So um, he was very famous. He became the, M the guru of um, the Ming uh, dynasty, the, the emperor of the Ming dynasty. 
and uh, so he traveled to China at that time, and uh, his activities were uh, very great there. His disciple, who was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty, was the Yongle Emperor. So um, the Yongle Emperor, and this is the same emperor who offered the very famous black hat uh, crown to the Kamapas. Uh, so this is the same emperor. The Kamapa, I mean, the emperor, Yongle Emperor, had three main gurus. One was from the Kamakaiku tradition, one was from the Saiku tradition, and one was from the Gil tradition. The one from the Kamakaiku tradition was the Kamapa at the time, who offered the hat, the black hat. And um, the one from the Sakyapa was Peichin Chueje, and one from the Giluk was Chamjin Chueje, Shakya Rishi. So these three were uh, the gurus of Yongle Emperor. And then, but uh, these three palaces, the Shitok, the Rinchen Kang, the Lakhon palaces died out eventually, leaving only the last palace, the Tuche palace, remaining. And from the Tuche palace, there were many great masters, and many great masters emerged, such as Nachan Kunga Rinchen, uh, who was the 23rd Sakatrichen. There was also Jamyang Sonam Wangbo, 24th Sakatrichen. Nachan Trapa Lodre, or Trapa Lodre, uh, the 25th Sakatrichen. And uh, also, the very famous author of the Saka genealogy, who was Jamgren Amesha, Nawakunga Sonam. He was the 27th Saka Chichen. And there was also Macha Kunga Dashi, uh, the 29th Saka Chichen. And uh, there was also Sachin Kunga Lodre, uh, the 31st Saka Chichen. And the Dogen Wang the Ningbo, the 32nd Saka Chichen. So all of these masters were from the Tuchu Palace. And uh, many of them were prophesied by Guru Dhamma Sambhava as well. And uh, these masters lived between the, uh, around the 16th century, the 15th uh, century till the, around the 19th century, uh, or 18th century. So it was around that period. And uh, from the Tuchu Palace itself emerged uh, a sub-palace, uh, um, which was known as the Tzedong Lava. Zedong Palace. And, uh, but that family line died out eventually as well. And that does not exist. But the palace exists, and His Holiness, uh, the 41st Komachijan Rinpoche, was born in Zedong, in the palace, in that palace. So, um, usually uh, we say, Densa Koma, Densa Oma, so Densa Oma, which is the lower palace, the lowest seat. So, Densa Koma, the upper seat, is the Sakya Monastery. And the lower seat is the Zedong Palace. And um, it's also known as Potala. Zedong Palace is also known as Potala. Uh, because it was considered as so important, uh, even though there existed the Potala Palace in Tibet in Lhasa, which is the seat of the Dalai Lamas, this uh, palace of the current family members of Zedong also got to use the name of Potala. But anyways, uh, although the Zedong Palace died out eventually, the main, uh, the main Tuche Palace, which the Zedong Palace had emerged from, the, the main palace had still continued to exist. And by the time of Drogo Wang de Ningbo, uh, Drogo Wang de Ningbo had four sons, Wang de Ningbo. So Wang de Ningbo's four sons were Denma Dindul Wangchuk, Kunga Renchen, Gombo Moju Balba, and Nongwa Kunga Gyalsen. So the first son was Benma Dindul Wangchuk. He was the um, 33rd Sakyatrichen, and he founded the uh, what we call the Joma Potong, or the Joma Palace. It was originally called Prinbal Potong, uh, but because Prinbal Potong was very close to the Joma Temple, uh, the Tara Temple in Sakya, it uh, got the name Joma, pa uh, Joma Potong. So that is uh, the lineage of Joma Potong. It was founded by Pema Dundu Wangchu. And there were great masters that emerged from that uh, lineage, such as Pechen Dashi Rinchen, Gunyin Sampen Nobu, Takshu Chene Rinchen, and His Holiness's father, Yabje Kunga Rinchen. And then we have the current living members of the Joma Palace, such as His Holiness, the 41st Komati Chene uh, both their holinesses, the Komachinjan Riches, and her eminence, Jason Kusha Chimanuddin, so they are the descendants of this family line. And then the second son of Wang Ningbo, whose name is 
Uh, not a lot of people got into him. Uh, he founded the Punzo Kodam uh, lineage uh, of the palace. And uh, there were great masters from this lineage as well, such as Mawang um, Kongwa Sonam, Zamling Chibu Wangdu, Mawang Toto Wangshuk, who was the Mawang Toto Wangshuk was the 40th Chichen before his name was the Kumar Chichen. And then uh, also in recent times, there was um, Sakatachin Rinpoche, Sakatachin Chita Rinpoche, my own grandfather, and so forth. And so I myself belong to this uh, palace. And then, so these two, Pema Dundun Wangchuk and Mao Kunga Chen, they two were lay practitioners, uh, mantra gardens. So they were, um, they could marry, they could have children, they could continue the family line. Their two younger brothers, um, Omo Jubalba and Mao Kunga Dalsen were monks. So although they two, they also founded palaces, the palaces only functioned during their lifetime. But uh, there was no lineage to continue it. So the buildings remained, but uh, no family lineage. So Kombo Mojo Balba founded the Deki Kodon, the Deki uh, uh, Palace. And Mao uh, Kumar Gyaltsen founded the Tashitsek Ladon, which is uh, the Tashitsek Palace. So these two um, were palaces, but just the buildings exist now, nothing else. So in that way, uh, the Kun family lineage uh, continues up until the present day. It's, they are the main upholders of the Vajrakilaya tradition coming from the Nyingma, originally from the Nyingma Pass, and also the main holders of the Langdui tradition, and uh, so forth. So, so far, the, it's, a, it's a paternal sort of lineage. Uh, it's, it's mainly uh, held by patriarchs, but however, it doesn't mean that there have not been great female masters. Uh, the female masters born into the Kun family lineage are called Jizun Mas. What, what do we mean by Jizun Mas? Ma is a, sort of like a, means a lady or mother. And Jizun, Jizun as we know is the usual word we call Jizun Mila Deva, Jizun Taba Gyaltsen. Uh, if you translate it into English, you could translate it as exalted one. But uh, what it really means is that Jizun means that if you put your trust and hope, and if you rely on this person, who, whoever is this Jizun, if you rely on this Jizun, they can liberate you. They have the power to liberate you. So this is what this is the meaning of Jizun. So anyone who has the Jizun, um, the great masters in the past who had the name such as Jizun, Miladeva, Jizun Tapagats, and so on, it means that uh, if you rely on them. They can they, they have the ability to liberate you. So Jizun Ma, you just add the name the word Ma, which and then you understand it as a female person. A female master who, if you put your hopes in them, they can liberate you. They can free you from suffering. So Jizun Ma. And there were many great Jizun Ma's. Uh, although one of the earliest members of or one of the earliest Jizun Ma's uh, is uh Sepadrin Mo. Her name is Serpa Rinmo, and uh, she doesn't seem to really clearly be mentioned in the Sakya genealogy or historical records. But this is something that uh, His Eminence Ludin uh, Kenshin Rinpoche often mentions, that uh, it seems that Sakya Pendita had a sister named Serpa Rinmo, and um, she was very devoted to Sakya Pendita, and uh, she passed away, I believe, in Lanzhou. And uh, she was a nun. And uh, there's uh, Nanzao, if you go to uh, for pilgrimage there, you'll find her footprints there, footprints imprinted in stone. And uh, also, there's a, there's a long stupa of hers, I believe, although I've never seen it with my own eyes. And there's a statue of her. It looks like a, a nun. I, I heard that many Chinese people, visitors, they mistake it. Uh, for a statue of a Chinese nun, but uh, it's actually a statue of the Jizuma, Sopa Rinmo. And it's said that um, <clears throat> um, at the moment when she passed away, she said, sentient beings die lying down. So therefore, I shall die lying, standing up. So she stood up and she died while standing up. That is a quite an achievement. 
Uh, so she was a great master, but uh, there are no really uh, clear uh, historical writings on her. Uh, whatever information we have on her is more mainly orally passed. Uh, so you hear from the masters directly. You don't find it on the writing side much. And um, from the Tujia Palace, there was a very famous Jizuma known as Jizuma Chimetembe Nima. Uh, she became she was related to the 31st Sakya teacher, Sachin Kumar Lodra. She was one of the main disciples of Sachin Kumar Lodra. Sachin Kumar Lodra had three pillar, oh sorry, four pillar-like disciples, and she was one of them. And she became a very important upholder of the Vajra Yogini teaching cycles. And uh, she also, uh, you will also find her name mentioned in the lineage of parting from the four attachments, the mind training of parting from the four attachments. And so um, she was a great master. And, uh, and then later on, from the Punzo Kodan, um, the Punzo Palace, there was a Jizuma known as Jizuma Tamjin Wangu. And she was also a great uh, saint. Um, it is said that um, she, had, she would read the Gangu, the, the collected writings of the, the, uh, of the Buddha, the words of the Buddha again and again, and whenever she read this, the history of Sakya, the Sakya genealogy, she would shed tears out of our great devotion. And uh, so she was a, a very great uh, Siddha and master. She was the guru of many uh, Sakya throne holders. And she was the guru of um, the 34th Sakya Trishan, whose name was Dojirinchen. Uh, and also, she was the guru of the Sakya throne holder from the Dramapadam, uh, known as Taichin Dashi Jinchin, and so forth. So she had about a total of about almost four or five Sakya uh, throne holders or Sakya teachers who were her disciples. And later on, uh, there was another uh, Sakya Jizuma from the Dramapadam, the Drama Palace. Her name was Gyamgan Dema Chinde. And uh, she was an early member of the, fam uh, of the family. His Holiness, the 41st Komachijan Vichy, I believe had never met her, but uh, she had, uh, I think, passed away when he was um, a child. And uh, he says that he may be, I, from what I heard, if I did not, if I heard it, if what I heard was correct, if I heard it incorrectly, he said something like um, uh, there was something going on uh, which seemed to be funeral uh, pro you know, processions or you know, preparations uh, being performed for her, but he is not too sure, I believe. But Jizum uh, Chimin had met her. Uh, and uh, also, my own uh, grandmother, uh, Dayun Chimo, Jayapamo, the wife of Sakadashan Vichy, she had actually received teachings from Gyamgad Dhamma Chine. So there are some very, very few disciples left of Gyamgad Dhamma Chine. But anyways, she had the title of Gyamgad. Gyamgad is usually a title which is only uh, named for the male members of the family, not usually for the female members. But because she was so holy, and she was the guru of many of the important uh, clan members, and, uh, and she was, her kindness to the Sakya tradition was so great, uh, she was given the title of Gyamgan. Gyam means uh, refuge, and Gun means protector. And so um, there's also a story related to her that uh, when she went to come, she was giving an initiation at, um, I think maybe Langlak Monastery. Uh, so, uh, and so anyways, at that time, there were some Giluk followers of the Giluk tradition who did not, who did not like that she was, who were not too happy that she was there and were trying to give teachings. And so she was on the throne giving teachings and uh, she was using the base. So anyways, um, especially they were not happy that a female teacher was giving teachings. So they sent a uh, monk police, which we call Dobdo. So they sent a dog or monk police, which are very tough-looking uh, 
uh, monks uh, that uh, carry whips and so on with them. And they usually beat other monks to discipline them. So um, they were sent to Gamga Bemartine to beat her. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, because it was not proper to just barge in into the, uh, in, uh, into the event where she was giving the empowerment, they slowly snuck in and uh, were sort of inspecting everything first. And um, they saw that Gamga Bemartine, she was holding a vase, but then her robe was starting to fall off. So in order to put her robe back on, she temporarily placed the, the vase in the sky, just like Jason Thomas does in this Rajanga. She placed the, the, va the vase, or the Pumba, we call it, Tibetan, in the sky. So it was floating in the sky, and then she put her robe, and she fixed her robe back, and then took it back in the sky. Uh, so when they saw that, then they knew that they were mistaken about her, and they felt great devotion, and then they joined in receiving the empowerment from her. So she is a great master. And then now, in recent times, um, the main, um, one of the most holiest Jizumas living is Jizum Kusha Chime uh, the elder sister of Solomon's Komatita Miche, and uh, she is a great practitioner of Vajra Yogini. You could say she is the authority of Vajra Yogini. She's also a guru, one of the gurus of His Holiness Komatita Miche, and she currently uh, is living in Vancouver, Canada, British Columbia, and uh, continuing with her practices every day. And I had the good fortune to meet her in the past few months. Um, I got to meet her two times, uh, just in this visit while I went to Vancouver. And also some, uh, she was there in uh, India for the empowerment of His Holiness, the 40 virgins of the So uh, it's wonderful that she could still uh, travel and she's still in good health. So we, we should pray for the uh, long life of uh, these masters, our gurus, uh, for the good health, uh, for their continuous dharma activities. And so this is something we should always uh, keep in mind. So anyways, um, following that, so this is uh, mainly the, the history of the mainstream sake tradition, which is uh, looked over by the Kun family, led by the Kun family. But from the mainstream psychic tradition, many branch schools or subsects emerged, such as um, the Morfa, the Tsapa, the Zongba, the Nalenda, uh, and so on. And um, there are other, some other traditions which are related, very closely related to the psychic tradition, such as the Jonang and the Buluk and the Podong traditions, and also the Shangba which is now considered as the Kaiki tradition. The Shangba is also closely related to the Saga. So anyways, um, the most, most famous is what we call Morzong Tsapsun, so Morpa, Zongba, Tsapa. So Morpa, the Morpa subsect was um, founded by Mochim Kunga Sambo, and he was also a descendant of the Kan family. <coughs> he was the son of the 16th Sakya Trichin, Bawenu uh, Kunga Rinchen. So, um, Morchen was a very special being because his emergence in this world, his birth was prophesied by Lord Buddha, Shakyamuni, in uh, not just one, but uh, in two sutras. So, there are two sutras uh, related. Uh, Talked by the Buddha, which have Morchen's name mentioned. The first one is uh, Sadharma Pundalika Sutra, the Sadharma Pundalika Sutra. And in the, that sutra, the Buddha says, At that time, an emanation of Lokanapa will appear. At that time, the Bhikshu uh, Ananda Bhajra will appear. So in this sutra, Sadharma Pundalika Sutra, Buddha Shakyamuni is saying that Morchen Kunga Sangbo. Is an emanation of Avalokiteshvara, and he will appear in the future. And sorry, this one, this one was from the Kusala Mula Paridara Sutra. The second one, which is from the Sadama Pundarika Sutra, goes as I announce to the Sangha a fully ordained monks, Ananda Bhadra, upholder of my Dharma, having honored six hundred million Sugatas, 
will become a Kung Fu in the future. His name will be Sagara Budhidharan. He will also be known then as the Abhijina Bhakta in the Buddha field that is lovely to behold and perfectly pure, Anunata Vaja Vajayanti. So in this sutra, if you cannot translate it, that's fine. But uh, anyways, the most important thing to know is that he was prophesized by the Buddha Shakyamuni. So he founded uh, Mor Ewam Chiden. He first trained at Saka Monastery itself, um, but he wanted to move to a more secluded place and uh, to sort of instigate or start a very uh, strict and wonderful, uh, authentic sort of uh, practice following the Vinaya tradition. So he therefore went to Shigatse and uh, founded more Ewam Chiden. And um, starting from him, uh, there were many, many masters uh, that emerged in the more Morpa tradition. Uh, his successors uh, came to be known as the more throne holders, and so far there have been 78 uh, more throne holders in total. So while in the, for the Sakya mainstream Sakya tradition, the throne holder so far there have been 43. In the more tradition, there have been 70. Uh, eight. Although the Moor tradition was founded later uh, compared to the, the mainstream Sakya tradition, the Moor throne holders were changed uh, more often and more quickly. So therefore, there, there are more members, more people, who, more masters who became more throne holders. So anyways, Moor um, Sangbo was a great master, especially he was authority on the subject of mantra, you could say tantra. Usually we say that from the Sakya tradition emerged many great masters. Uh, and just like um, India, just like Nalanda had produced the six ornaments, the six ornaments of Nalanda, likewise there is such a thing called the six ornaments of Tibet. And all of these are Sakya masters. Um, there are two masters who were extremely learned in sutra, the topic of sutra, and these were what we call yak rong, so yak ten sanke pao and rong ten sheja kunjik. So yak ten and rong ten, so two masters. They were great scholars on the topic of sutra, and there are two masters who were scholars, uh, experts in the topic of uh, the subject of mantra or tantra. They were what we call morzong, so morchen ungasango. Uh, founder of the Moor tradition and Zongba Kungalanga, the founder of the Zongba tradition, um, one of the founders of the Zongba tradition. And then there are two masters who are well learned in both Sutra and Tantra, and they are called what we call Koshak Nami, so Koram Basunam Singe, who belonged to the Moor branch school of Sakya. He is one of the most famous and learned Sakya masters following Sakya Pendit. And um, when we study in the Sakya uh, colleges and Sakya universities, uh, may most of the philosophical studies are based on his writings, Koram Basunam Singe. And then the other is Shakya Chokden, Benjin Shakya Chokden, who is also a great uh, master. So these are the six ornaments of uh, Tibet. So uh, continuing with that, um, anyways, the Morpas became great upholders of the Lamja tradition. And so later on, uh, even the current members would rely on the Morpa masters many a time and receive the Lamja and the more uh, tradition in the Morpa lineage. So what I see is that um, usually we have the Dalai Lamas and the Benchen Lamas, the teacher and disciple relationship. The Sakya Khan family and the masters of the more tradition have a similar relationship because the current masters usually rely upon more masters as their teachers. And uh, it goes both ways as well. So it's uh, similar, we can understand it in that way. And then uh, we have uh, the Tsalpa tradition, which was founded by Tsalchen Losa Gyatso, who originally started as a Gilukpa monk, but uh, later on due to his karma and his past prayers, 
he met the master Qin Fang Do Ling Fang, um, we call it Lord Do Ling Fang. And uh, from him, he received the teachings, the sake teachings related to Vajra Yogini. And in that way, uh, he attained great Siddhi. And um, there are many masters who emerged from his tradition, such as Meng Tu, Lu Zhu Gyatso, and so forth. And uh, the masters from Cao Chen's tradition eventually uh, became the gurus, the Lamdre gurus of the Dalai Lamas. So, they are very important. Uh, the Tsapas, especially Cao Chen, is the upholder of what we call the so-called whispered lineage. So, he's very important in our history. Then we have the, the Zongba tradition. Uh, it seems that uh, many people make the mistake, the common mistake, to say that Zongba Kungwa Namgyal was the founder of the Zongba tradition, but it seems that actually the founder of the Zongba tradition was Zongba Kungwa Gyalsen. Zongba Kungwa Gyalsen was the founder of the tradition, and but he did not seem to have really founded a monastery. He had his views and his special unique practices, and uh, these practices were um, passed down from his down to his successors up until Konkar Dojo Zongba Kungwa Namgyal, what we call Zongba Kungwa Namgyal in short, and uh, Kungwa Namgyal. Founded the Zongba, sorry, he founded the Konga Lojiden Monastery, or the Konga Monastery, Konga Chede. And uh, that later became the seat of the Zongba. Uh, actually, it seems that Konga Lojiden was own practices are a mixture of the, the Zongba tradition and also possibly the Puluk tradition, which is uh, the, tra tra the tradition of Putun and Chintu. Uh, so anyways, um, you could say that Zongba Kunga Gyalsen was the founder of the earlier Zongba, and Zongba Kunga Namgyal was the founder of the later Zongba tradition. And then we have another subsect which uh, has sort of like uh, been mixed up or merged with the Tsapa tradition, but is actually a separate tradition from the Tsapas. It is called the Nalendra tradition. And this was founded by Rongpen Sheja Kunri, which I mentioned earlier. Rongpen was one of the masters who is a scholar of poetry in this topic of uh, sutra. So Rongten founded Nalendra, and uh, Nalendra Monastery became a great university for the uh, study of Sakya philosophy. And um, the upholders of this tradition, the leaders of this tradition, came to be known as the Choke Chichens, the, uh, the heads of the Choke uh, school or uh, subsect. But uh, so in Tibet, uh, the Tsapa, main seat of the Tsapa, which subsect which is Dajomache, and the main seat of the Nalanda, which is Na the Nalanda Monastery, uh, have different practices. Uh, all the tradition, of the, the way you the mus musical instruments are uh, performed and uh, used, and uh, there are differences. And uh, so there are different traditions, but um, the Nalandas are still upholders of the Tsapa tradition. So later. In exile, uh, outside of Tibet, the Nalendas have become the head of the Tsapa tradition, as well as their own tradition, of course. So Nalenda and Tsapa have become merged or mixed. So that is something uh, worth noting. And then, um, according to the writings uh, of Jamyang Kenze Wongo, the Jornam, the Puluk, and the Podong traditions, uh, they sort of emerged from the Sakya tradition. The views, um, the masters, or the founders of these traditions, all trained in the Sakya tradition in the early stages. For example, if you look at the Jonang uh, tradition, I think I believe it's Jonang Kunten Chuk Chukwese, who was a disciple of, um, yeah, it was Kunten Chukwese, or you could say Chukwese was a disciple of um, Sakya Pendita, and later on Tolpa Bashir Gyalsen. He trained in Sakya and um, had seems to have had a teacher-disciple relationship with Lama Thamma Sonam Gyaltsen, the 14th teacher. And um, then there is Taranatha, uh, Jitin Taranatha, the great Jonam master. He was also a, a great master who, Jonam and Sakya were master, who is said to have bestowed the Lamdre around 40 times, only 40 times. And, um, and of course, there's Jonam Kunga Drolshok, and such masters from the Jonangba tradition. And if you look at their biographies, 
they state that they consider themselves as Sakya masters, but their view is a little bit different from the mainstream Sakya tradition, because the mainstream Sakya tradition's view on the emptiness is the emptiness of self, while theirs is the emptiness of others, which we call Shentong. So it's a different view, but they still got along with the Sakyapas, and the Sakyapas, like Lama Thamba, the 14th teaching, received many teachings from the Jonapas. There's a saying that in the early part of Lama Thamba's life, he received, uh, he practiced the Lamdian mainly, but in the later part of his life, he focused more on the Jonang practices, such as the six yogas of Jonang. So Jonang is an important tradition. Nowadays, it is it has long been separated from the Sakyapas, so it stands on its own as an independent, separate uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition. <clears throat> and then there is the Puluk, which is also known as Shalu, and that was founded by Kuben Vinchendruk, one of the greatest historians of Tibet, and he was the cataloger. Uh, he was responsible for creating the catalog of the Kangyur and Tengyur, the uh, works of the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha, to his disciples. And his tradition is called the Puluk. And uh, so there's that lineage. And um, then there is the Podong, which uh, there were many masters such as Podong Benchen Chokle Nangya. So Podong Benchen, so many great masters from that lineage as well. So in any ways, you know, all of these lineages connected to the three, to the Sakya tradition. The Sakya tradition uh, itself is greatly connected with the other three Tibetan Buddhist traditions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the family members were followers, the current family members were followers of the, uh, the Nyingmapa tradition in the early stage. So you can say Sakya emerged from the Nyingma. And uh, you can say that the Giluk emerged from Sakya because Jetsong Kapa, and Losan Tapa, and Gyalsam uh, Pama Rinchen, and Kepi Kele Pasan, the three founders of the Giluk tradition all started up out uh, in the beginning as Sakyapa monks. They trained at the Sakyapa universities. And then later, uh, it became separate. Their tradition became separate and is now known as the Gelugpa tradition. So, as you can see, Sakya came from Nyingma, Gelug came from Sakya. So, it's, uh, it's all very strongly connected with each other. And as for the Gargi tradition, um, Gaiki itself is sort of like a separate uh, tradition. It comes down from the teachings of Marpa, Mienalepa, and Gambopa. But um, it emerged around the same time as the Sakya tradition because if you look at the life of Kumkuncha Gyalbo and Marpa Lotzawa, it seems to show, it's clear that they shared the same teacher, Drogmi Lotzawa. Drogmi Lotzawa was the teacher who taught the tantras, some of the new tantras to Kumkuncha Gyalbo. And Dromi Lotzawa was the Sanskrit language teacher to Marpa Lotzawa. So Marpa Lotzawa learned Sanskrit. And in order to become a translator, at that time you needed to learn Sanskrit, and he learned that from Dromi Lotzawa. So it emerged around the same time. And so the, these are all greatly connected. And um, even in the Sakya tradition, we have the teachings of Vajra Yogini, uh, the Naru Hichari teachings, the Naru Vajra Yogini teachings, and these stream down from Master the Naropa. So usually Master Naropa and Tilopa are considered as the founders or the earliest members of the Kagyu tradition, but, and, but there are also some teachings which Naropa passed down not through the Kagyus, but rather it came down through the Sakyapas. So Naropa passed on the Vajra Yogini teachings uh, to the Pamping brothers, who are two Nepali brothers, brothers from the country of Nepal, we call them the Pumping Brothers, and they passed it down to the Tibetan translators and came down to then to the Sakyapa founders. So the Sakyapas uphold these lineage. So as I mentioned, we have the Vajra Hilaya, then Ke Vajra, then now we have the Vajra Yugini, and um, then there's also the Chakra Samvara lineages, which is also quite strongly connected with the Vajra Yugini. And then um, we have the the 13 golden dharmas, and uh, so forth. And we also have the lineage of, of the dharma protectors, such as Mahakala, the four-faced Mahakala, and uh, all of the different dharma protectors, which still exist to this present day. So this is um, the connections. <coughs> Jairan Kinzer Wombo says that um, 
almost all of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, are, and the masters of almost all the traditions are disciples, have been disciples of the Sakyapa tradition. Or if not, they still greatly admire and respect the Sakyapa tradition because the masters from the family clans of So, Zul, and Nuf of the Nyingmapa tradition were all uh, So, Zul, and Nuf. Uh, they were all uh, followers of the uh, Sakyapa tradition. Uh, they greatly admired the teachings of the Sakya Pandita and Shakya Papa. And then from the Kadamba, Kadamba also emerged around the same time as the Kalakirin Sakya, uh, but a little earlier, some decades earlier, but around the same century. So the Kadamba tradition, which was founded by, mainly it's uh, to the teachings of Atisha, based on the teachings of Atisha, uh, Atisha's disciple, Domdamba Gyare Jumne, or Domdamba in short, founded Redding Monastery, and that, from that the Kadamba tradition was founded. And uh, from them, many masters such as Namkabum and so forth were disciples of Sakyapendita and Papa. And uh, so we're very strongly connected. Nowadays, the Kadamba doesn't exist anymore. It sort of went extinct as a separate tradition, but it's a lineages, the teaching practice lineages have been scattered and the Sakyapas, the Kalkipas, and the Gilupas have taken upon the, themselves the responsibility of guarding uh, the Kadamba teachings from dying out. So we all are the upholders of their teachings. And then, um, so we have the Kadamba. And then from the Kalkipa, there is the Kamapa Tusum Kemba, who was the founder of the Kamakagi tradition. And he received the Lamdre from three of Sachin Kumanyama's disciples. Um, so there's a connection with the Kakipas, the Kamakamsans, and Kakipas. And then from the Padukagyu tradition, there is the founder of that tradition who is known as Pamadrupa. Pamadrupa. And uh, he was a direct disciple of Sachin Kumanyingbo. And uh, he learned the Lamdre from Sachin, meditated for probably around 12 years at Sakya under Sachin's guidance. And um, he attained great realization. He even wrote a commentary on the uh, Lamdre, which exists. And um, he later, following Sachin, when he was passing, he became a disciple of Chitin Chapa. And following that, he then went to uh, Melavipa's disciple, Gambopa and uh, received teachings from Gambopa, which further enhanced his realization. And uh, it was from Pamadrupa's many disciples, his own many disciples, that the Jigun Kagyu, the Drupa Kagyu, the Kalun Kagyu, and the, what we call the eight minor Kagyu traditions emerged. So as you can see, these are all related to the Sakyapas as well, disciples of the Sakyapas. And then uh, from the Drupa Kagyu, uh, one of the most famous members is uh, Shabdung Nong Nangyal, the unifier and founder of the state of Bhutan, uh, the kingdom of Bhutan. So Shabdung Nong Nangyal. And uh, Shabdung Nong Nangyal was the disciple of the 24th Sakya teaching, Njamyang Sona Wangho, from the Sakya Future Paths. So uh, he received the complete Lamje teachings from him. So from the Dupakagyu, that is our connection with them. And then uh, from the Shangba Kagyu, Shangba Kagyu, it's actually originally just known as Shangba because it's not really Kagyu. Kagyu should, is mainly the tradition which stems down from Malpa, Milavepa, and Gambopa, but the Shangba lineage does not come down from their teachings. It comes down from a separate master known as Kyungbo Naljo. But anyways, uh, Shangba's teachings are a mixture of Sakya and Kagyu teachings, uh, their own of course. But nowadays, it's uh, uh, categorized as the Kagyu uh, tradition. But uh, masters such as Mok Chokpa and Nyen um, Debe Naljo and so forth were disciples of the Sakyapa, such as Jitun Chapa. And uh, of course, you know, we have the Gyebupa tradition, uh, Jetson Kapa. He was a great disciple of Jitun Jendawa, Sakya master. And also a disciple of master, Sakyapa masters such as Nyawen, Ungapel, uh, I believe Sasan, Malti Benchen, and uh, Lama Thambasonam Jalsen, and so forth. So he received uh, many teachings from them, empowerments, uh, uh, sutra and tantra. And um, 
So if his disciples, early disciples such as Delta and Ketris were also trained in Sakya. So these are all disciples of the Sakyabas in the beginning. So in this, in this way, we have a connection with all of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions. And so therefore, it's very important to harbor the pure uh, vision of pure perception towards all, um, all the Dharma traditions as pure, authentic traditions. I like to think of the example of that uh, all of these di different traditions are like different airlines, uh, uh, different planes belonging to different companies, which land at the same airport. The goal is the same, but the company is different, the service is different, the staff is different, and everything is different. And maybe the shows are different and so on, and the food is different. Everything is a little different, but the purpose it gets you to the same place, the same airport. Uh, and so likewise, all of these uh, different traditions, it has a different um, lineage masters. The focus, uh, it shares the same basic principles such as loving kindness, compassion, emptiness, and uh, all of these, but uh, the focus is sometimes a bit different. The emphasis is a bit different on these different practices. Um, and so, but the goal is the same. It all, it, these are all show a method, a way to attain enlightenment. Some people have a special karma to follow the Nyingmatma tradition. They like the Dzogchen teachings, and they, they sometimes will find better results if they follow that tradition. That is their karma. And whatever your karma is, you should follow that tradition. Some people have more karma to be benefited to the Lamjas teachings and the Sakyapas. For that, we have the, Lam the Sakyapa tradition, and so forth for the Gaitu and the Gedit, and so forth, so on. But now, and nowadays, uh, also, uh, of course, we have this thing called non-sectarianism. Uh, around, around the 19th century and 20th century, there were great masters of the non-sectarian movement, such as Jamyang Kenze Wangbo, Shogyu Deshen Ingba, Jamgyun Gong to Lodas Haye, and Jayan Kenze Chugyu Lodur, and so forth. These were all great non-sectarian masters. Um, and uh, they practiced all of these different traditions and offered pure vision towards all of them equally. But I think, my way of seeing it, nowadays, people think of non-sectarianism as a complete different thing. They like to say, I'm, I'm, they don't like to say I'm Sakya, and they try to avoid saying I'm Sakya. They don't want to say it as if it's a bad thing to consider themselves as Sakya, or I'm not a Nima, I'm neither Gaikyo, I'm a follower of the Buddha, or the Lama Jine, or something like that. But uh, I think that's a little uh, misconception, a misunderstanding of the word Jime. To understand the word Jime properly, um, we need to understand all of the traditions. We need to learn their practices. We need to be accustomed. We need to have an understanding of all of the traditions' practices. You cannot become Jime if you do not understand the practices of the four traditions. Just not practicing anything and saying, I'm a follower of Buddha, I don't follow any particular tradition, is a very lazy thing to do. It's just a lazy excuse. So if you look at um, the lives of the masters, Jayan Kenzo Wongbo, for example, he was Jume, but he based his main practices on the Sakyapa tradition. And on top of that, he practices, practiced the other traditions and he became a non-sectarian master. But Shogyu Dejan Nyingma, he based his practices mainly on the Nyingmapa tradition, and then he practiced others and uh, the Jume master as well. Jamgu Gongchu, mainly on the Kama Kagyu, the Kagyu, and then also other traditions. And so forth. So that's how you do it. You you need to base your practices on one main lineage, and then if you want to be a jime and non-sectarian, then you need to practice the other things. But still, you need to have a stable base. I find it similar to you know, these people who say, "I'm not this, I'm not that, but I'm a follower of Buddha." Uh, similar to you know, how if a person asked another person, "What did you eat?" Uh, you know, they would ask, "Did you eat?" Did you, did you eat? And the person replies, yes, I did. So when the person says, yes, I did eat, it's similar to saying, yes, I'm a follower of the Buddha. But then uh, if the person were to ask, what did you eat? So he already said, I ate, or he or she already said, I ate. So if you were to further ask, but what did you eat? And this person doesn't remember what they ate, or has no reply, then that is similar to saying, I'm a follower of the Buddha, but you don't have any reply to what particular lineage you're following. If you do not follow a particular lineage, there's no blessings coming down from the Buddha. To receive, the, to receive realization, you need blessings. To receive blessings, 
you need a lineage in which the blessings are passed down from one master to another. If you do not you know, follow a uh, lineage, but you want to receive it straight from the Buddha, then that, uh, there's no real lineage. Unless you're very holy and you, can, you have the pure vision, as I mentioned in the Nima tradition, you have visions of the masters like Guru Rinpoche and they give you teachings directly. That's a different case, but uh, this is just a lazy excuse. So therefore, we need to be careful. We should base our practices on one particular tradition and then have harbor pure vision towards all others. And that is called Jime, a non-sectarianism. So this is something to keep in mind. So <clears throat> once again, to remind you, in the Kun family, the upholders of the Saka tradition, we have the, the members of the both palaces, the Doma and the Pindra palaces. In the war tradition, the leaders of that tradition, there are generally, speaking, <clears throat> four, generally four uh, houses, or four palaces, you could say. Uh, they are the Luding, the Pace, the Kamsa, and the Pende. So Luding, Pace, Kamsa, Pende. So from the Luding, we have uh, uh, the French masters such as Luding Kenshin Rinpoche, Luding Ken Rinpoche, Luding Shabu Rinpoche. They are the current living masters of that. That is also a family lineage, like the Kun, but it's not a father-son lineage. It's uh, the masters have to be from uncle to nephew. So it functions a bit differently. Uh, and then um, there's the Pazze, uh, Pazze lineage. And the current master, the only master from that lineage which currently exists is Pazze Kerenbeche, who is, at the moment, I believe, still in the US. I'm not sure if he has left yet, but he was traveling in the US very recently. And then um, from the Kamsa, we have Kamsa Shabrun Rinpoche, uh, who is studying in India. And uh, then there's Pende uh, from Tibet, Pende Ken Rinpoche, who is stationed in Tibet. So these are the heads of uh, the Moor tradition. So it starts as a Shabrun, uh, or like a prince, a Dharma prince, and then it goes, you, you get elevated up to the position of Kim, Kenchen, or throne holder, or abbot of the Moor tradition. So that's for the war. And then for the, as I mentioned, the Tsapa, uh, there's no real particular head of the Tsapa, but because Nalinda is now mixed with Tsapa, the Chokhi teachings are now the head of the Tsapa tradition. And then for the Konga tradition, uh, the Chokhi, first of all, the Chokhi tradition is also a lineage. It is called the Che lineage. It's a family lineage, just like the Kun. So this Kun lineage, the Luding lineage, and the Che lineage, uh, these three are family lineages. and um, they don't share the same origins as the general Tibetan population. Uh, usually we say the, the ancestors of the Tibetan were a monkey, a monkey king, and a rock demoness. But these three families do not share the same uh, origin. Their ancestors are heavenly gods, so they come directly from the heavens. And now for the Konga, or the Dzongba tradition, uh, the head of that is um, Konga, Dojidemba, Konga Namgyal. This is not a family lineage, but is, it is a Tuku reincarnation system. So it's a Tuku lineage. So these are the lineages. But anyways, um, the Sakya tradition has been, in the current year, is 949 years old uh, since its founding. And um, as I mentioned, it was founded in 1073, so it's been a long time, but all of these traditions through many difficulties and many changes of times have survived up until the present moment. Um, and so therefore we should feel lucky that these teachings, these lineages continue to exist who uphold the very precious teachings of the Sakyabas. And um, there is a calculation system according to Buddhism of um, how many years has passed since the Buddha's passing since the Buddha passed into Parinibbana. And usually, uh, according to the Theravada tradition, we say over 2,500 years, something like that. Probably now 2,550 years over that. Right. But uh, according to the Sakyapa tradition's calculation system, actually around 4,000 years have passed since the Buddha's um, passing. And in a way, um, this is not really good news because um, the Buddha's um, dharma is only meant to remain or last for 5, 000, around 5,000 years. 
So after the Buddha passes away, the Buddha Dharma or Buddhism is meant to only survive for 5,000 years. And following that, it's to die out. And if according to our system, 4,000 years have passed already, then we are very close to the near or end of Buddhism. So of course this is not good news, but I'm mentioning this because it may serve as an inspiration to work hard with the understanding of the little time we have left, with the little time that we have left, um, that uh, Buddhism remains in this world. It might inspire us or push us to not waste time and to you know, strengthen our efforts in our Dharma practice and benefiting others. But anyways, in the year 1073, uh, when Kunko Jogyabo founded the first monastery, like a monastery, around 3,207 years had already passed at that time. So around this year, the current year, around just around, I cannot say for sure, but in this year, 2022, 4,155 years, around that, this time has already passed. So one thing to mention, in the photos we see um, the Sakya Monastery in Tibet, there's like a square-shaped large uh, monastery. But this is not the original monastery which Kankun Shukdabha founded. The original monastery was on the hill. Uh, and um, that survived till around 900, around 900 years, just up until 1959. And then it was uh, destroyed, unfortunately. So that was founded by Kankun Shukdabha. And then the, the one we see nowadays, which is below the hill, the square-shaped, large, very majestic-looking monastery, uh, which almost looks like a palace, a fortress. That is the Sakya Monastery, which was uh, founded by Dogon Chogyapapa, the, the ruler of Tibet and the seventh Sakya Trichin. So the first monastery was, by Kampan Chogyapapa, was founded in the 11th century, and the one we see nowadays, which is below the hill, was founded in the 13th century. So when the... This, the, the one we see nowadays, it was mainly founded according to Trigger Papa's wishes, but it was the actual person who took the responsibility to found it or to build it up was uh, the minister known as Brenchen Shakya Sangbo. And when he built this monastery, around 3,400 years had passed since the Buddha's passing. So when the first Sakya monastery had, was built, 3,207 3, years had passed. When the current monastery we have by now, which by now is around a little around 700 years since its founding, when it was first built, 3,400 years had passed since Buddha Shakyamuni had passed away. And uh, when Morichin Kunga Sangbo founded Mor Ewangche in Shigatse, uh, around 14, uh, which he founded in the year 1429, which is the 15th century. At that time, uh, 3,562 years had passed since Lord Buddha Shakyamuni's passing into Father Dharma. And when Rongpen uh, Sheja Kunji, uh, the founder of Nalanda Monastery, not the one of course in India, but the one in Tibet, the Penyin Nalanda Monastery, when he founded that monastery, uh, which he founded in 1436, also in the 15th century, uh, around 3,569 years had passed. So by that time, a lot of years had already passed. So by now, it's about 4,155 years. So um, now is the age of the decline of the Dharma. Uh, it's called the degenerate ages. It only gets worse from here. But um, looking at the positive side, we are all born with the human life, we have all come in contact with the precious Dharma, with the solution to being freed from suffering, um, taught by the Buddha, which is like the nectar or medicine, and um, we have all had the great fortune to meet our root gurus, great enlightened masters like the holinesses, who are here, and also the other masters who are living in the other countries, and um, as we have gathered here, we will continue to get the chance day by day to receive uh, the Dharma teachings. 
uh, we should always make sure to receive as much Dharma teachings as we can as the masters are living, as these are, this is a very precious time. Uh, at the best, we should make the effort to attend and follow the teacher wherever the Dharma pro programs are um, going to be held. And if not, due to health reasons, or you know, old age, or some other difficulties, we should at least try to join. Now we have social media, uh, we can join the teachings through Zoom and YouTube, and live, there's such a thing called live streaming, so which we did not have in the past, so but now we have that, so that is also always an option. But the best way is to follow the Guru in their footsteps. There's a, the more effort you make, uh, the more negative karma is purified and the more good merit is accumulated. You know, in a way, you know, if you think about the past lives of the, the masters like Chandrasambhadadamu, the Bodhisattva, the ever-weeping Bodhisattva, so, so, so such masters, they travel from desert to desert, would poke holes in their, uh, their skin to put butter lamps as offerings to their teachers or Buddhas, and they would search, they would even cut their limbs just for just to receive one line or teaching of the precious Dharma. That is how much they valued uh, the Buddha Dharma. Nowadays, it's a little bit uh, not like that. It's a, we've become a little bit lazy. Uh, we want everything to be easy going for us. And um, live streaming, and you know, that's easy in a way. Of course, just the fact that you're attending it is very nice. You're listening to it, but. Uh, it's easy, you do not need to go anywhere, you can just sit in your bed and in your home, you can relax and uh, you don't need to go anywhere. Not too much effort is made in that. So if you are in the right condition to make an effort, then you must and should and please do make the effort uh, to follow the teachers and receive the Dharma teachings. So finally, uh, with this I conclude uh, my talk and um, we will recite the dedication and merit. Uh, because with this, um, there's great merit in extolling the history of the Sakyapa tradition and the great masters because it's not any ordinary teaching, but uh, it's uh, the history, it's the Dharma history. So it's a basically, this is also a Dharma teaching. So therefore, with this, by listening to this teaching, we have accumulated great merit. It's this, with this merit, we should dedicate it. We should not, if we do not dedicate it, the merit is not safely stored. It becomes wasted. Uh, dedicating the merit is like depositing one's money in a bank, it's safely stored. So likewise, if we dedicate the merit to enlightenment, for the enlightenment of all sentient beings, then the merit that we have accumulated does not get wasted, and we can enjoy it up until we ourselves attain enlightenment. So basically, dedication and merit is the Buddhist idea, the Mahayana idea of dedication and merit, is to pray that through the merit, whatever merit one has accumulated through this merit, may this merit serve as a cause for all sentient beings to swiftly attain enlightenment. This part of prayer is called dedication, the dedication of merit. So we will decide this now.